Hello and welcome back to a brand new episode of the Pick Aside Podcast. My name is Joel Moran and I'm here with River Brown, John Tortorelli, and this is now episode 177. In this episode, we are going to talk about Dylan Brooks' suspension, if Luka's ball dominance is hurting the Mavericks, what the Wolves should do with D'Angelo Russell, and breaking down potential trade destinations for Zach Levine. A quick YouTube member and Patreon shout out to Danko Hawkins, Matthew Jimenez, Kush God, River Smells Like Beer Ankles, Terry Scary, Icon No Cap Anthony, Caleb, Travis, Drews the Goat, Holmes, Nairi, your boy Nick, Pimp Chimpin, Jake the Snake, Corrupt, G Boog, Kobe, Dylan, Mason, Rivs Hair, Mad Sexy, Gentile Drew, Cade MVP, Mark, SP Horsey Shot, Jordan What, Evan, Dylan, Joel is the GOAT, Mayo, Andre, Peter, Daniel, Ben, Ruthless Rootster, Sensei Stevie, Joel B, SA Crimes, Kevin S, Eagle, Dalla, Tizzy, Corey, Get Funkoed, Dylan, Playboy, Orlando, Big Chuck, Michael, Greg, Cole, Liam, T Grove, 17, Tua Sucks, on car Ryan, Epic Lankiness, It's Black Ace, Anthony, BJ, PJs, Langston, Jazzy, Juice, Johannes, Dave McLaurin, Muffins, John, Sean, Burner Hoops, Court Cousins, George, Hakari, and Jay Aqua. Good old Jay Aqua. Um, it's not the same if Drew doesn't do it. Yeah, and I wasn't doing it. Um, what were those uh, two <laughs> two names? Riv smells like deer ankles. Uh huh. And Riv's hair is mad sexy. Okay. <laughs> I think you was talking about when you had braids, though. Undoubtedly. Not right now. No, no, not right yeah, now. Not right no. now. Your hair is kind of doesn't look sexy. Yeah. Doesn't look like it. So right now, my Twitter's in a frenzy, which is odd territory for me. So I posted a post draft NFL 2022 power rankings, and right now it has 852 likes, mm. 333 quote tweets. 414 replies and then 52 regular retweets. Oh, okay. Damn. Yeah. The retweet to uh, like ratio sucks. Yeah. People are mad because people are mad about this. This is how it happened. I have to just to reiterate my power rankings it's Bills at one, Rams two, Chargers three, Bengals four, Bucks five, Colts six, Broncos seven, Chiefs eight, nine Packers, 10 Ravens, 11 Eagles. 12 Browns, 13 Vikings, 14 Raiders, 15 Saints, 16 Niners, 17 Washington, 18 Titans, 19 Jets, 20 Dolphins, 21 Cowboys, 22 Steelers, 23 Cardinals, 24 Patriots, 25 Lions, 26 Jaguars, 27 Panthers, 28 Giants, 29 Seahawks, 30 Texans, 31 Falcons, and 32 Bears. So what people are mad about, it came in waves. It four fan bases I can point out are mad about this list. The first one being the Dolphins. The Dolphins fans are mad that I have the Jets over them. Right. They're mad about the list. Right. Then Chiefs Twitter found my list and they're mad that they're under the Broncos, Colts. Where'd you have the Chiefs? Eight. Oh. They're behind the Broncos, the Colts, the Bucks, Bengals, Chargers, Rams, and Bills. You have the Colts top seven. They're my sixth best team. Oh shit! Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, you got my Eagles up there. That's all I care about. <laughs> Steelers are finishing higher than twenty-two. Some people have no. The Steelers are gonna suck. <laughs> some people, some people have told me that the Colts are too high, but I don't think so. I mean, last year people said they were dark horse Super Bowl contenders, and then Carson went to wet the bed. Right. You know they have the same players. They had this. They had the most Pro Bowlers in the NFL last year. They added Stephon Gilmore with Yannick Ngakwe with Matt Ryan. I don't know how they don't get any better. They got significantly better, and people are talking about their wide receiver core, but they drafted a receiver out of Cincinnati, Alec Pierce, in the second round. 6'3", one's a 4-4-1. He's going to have a, a pretty good year for a rookie, I believe, next to Michael Pittman. George Pickens will be better. <laughs> no. <laughs> and then, so Chiefs Chiefs Twitter was mad at me. Dolphins Twitter was mad at me. Bears Twitter recently just found my that, list. That they're the worst team in the league. And they are annoyed <laughs> that they are the last team in the league. But to me, between the Seahawks, Texans, and Falcons, 
even Giants, whichever way you want to order it, I don't really care. I just put the Bears last because I think the Falcons have a better secondary. I like their weapons better with Kyle Pitts and Drake Linden. Um, it's just better. I yeah. mean, they both suck relatively, so yeah, it doesn't really matter. The Bears, like, they're just not, they're going to be bad. Love Justin Fields, though. Titans fans also got mad at my list a lot um, because I had them 18, and that's, like, really low for them, I guess. <laughs> uh, so they're mad. So, yeah, though, and Cowboys fans also are a bit upset, but not as upset as Dolphins, Chiefs, and Bears fans. They're really upset. Every single time I go on Twitter, I can't even, like, I refresh my notification. I got to refresh it again, but people are just talking about it too much. Damn. Good luck Pretty with good. that, man. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I'm going to do multiple rankings, though. What I'm going to do is that these are my post-NFL draft rankings. But once the NFL releases the schedule, and I know when teams play, and I can predict records, I'm going to make a new ranking for that. So this is just like my first draft, the ranking. Now. Yeah, and everybody's going into a frenzy. I didn't, I didn't know I was going to get this much traction. I'm actually very surprised. But they say bad publicity is good publicity regardless. So let's get it. You nervous? You yeah. sure? No, I'm just kind of shell-shocked you have the Steelers at 22. Oh. They're finishing. You guys suck. You guys aren't that good. They're going to finish <laughs> in the playoffs. <laughs> Trust. That's ridiculous. Deshaun's going to be suspended. Probably won't win the division. I think three teams can make it. Out of the AC North, but I mean it depends. So on the, then, on the West, what about yeah, like yeah, because you know. only two teams can make it then. So what about the East? One team's making it out of there. Ravens, Browns, and Cincy are all better than you. I mean, the Browns also might not have their quarterback for like almost half the year, but yeah, they still had Jacoby Brissett. Oh my God, who's just as good as any of your quarterbacks? <laughs> well, not Lamar. Um, the Steelers had the Browns number. They have uh, for the most part. A um, couple of playoff games or one specific. They beat you in the playoff games. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, yeah. But last year we got them both times. So, so this is going to be a great episode. We're going to talk a lot about basketball, a lot of rumors, player movement. I talk about the playoff series that are currently going on in the second round. So let's start off with Zion Williamson because he came out in his exit interview with the Pelicans. He talked to the media and a reporter asked him a question would you sign an extension if it was offered to you? Zion at first was like, wait, say that again? Say that again? He, he's Zion said, say that again almost like three times. The reporter asked the question again, and Zion said, of course, I couldn't sign it fast enough. Now, that led a lot of people to speculating about Zion's future and uh, whether he wants to be there. I know throughout the year that's been a big-time headline, and David Griffin came out and said that there are some concerns about extending him long-term, because of his health. Now, what do you think about Zion saying this? How good can the Pelicans be next season? I know we talked about it with Lowe when he was on the show that they maybe should consider trading Zion. So what do you think, Riv? Well, I was reading up on the reports. Brian Windhorse, you know, I'm sure he's an okay, you know, guy to trust. But he said they're going <laughs> to like they're gonna give him a similar deal to like uh, what they give Embiid in 2017. Just the only difference is Embiid and the, Philly, the Sixers were on the same page. So it's going to come with some restrictions. It might not come with the full five years. It might not come with a team option or a player option. But that's just what I read. New Orleans should be excited. You know, this is probably the first good buzz they've had in a while. You know, they should definitely be excited about this team. You know, they have Jose Alvarado, Trey Murphy, Herb Jones. Then they have C.J. McCollum, Brandon Ingram, Larry Nance Jr., Jackson Hayes. So a good combination of youth, a couple guys with experience, you know. So they should definitely be excited about this team. Zion coming in. It's going to be weird. You know, this is a guy who offensively, he's great. But defensively, he's he's pretty much a problem. He can't guard. He has pigeon feet. He struggles to move. But I think as an off-ball defender, he can be really good. You know, he has – maybe he can be a help side defender. You know, it's still – he hasn't played much, so it's really hard to gather what he's going to be. But I think, you know, looking at it just from a point-blank view, you look at the roster, you add Zion, this team should be a top-six team in the West. You know, top-six, top-seven. They should be a playoff team. You know, Brandon Ingram should take the next step next year. You still have guys with a chip on their shoulders as rookies. You know, they'll also have another pick in this draft. If I'm not mistaken, they have the Lakers pick. So they'll they have they, see. So they'll have a they'll have they'll definitely have a pick. So that's another guy that they could bring in that's a media impact player. Or trade it and package it for a player. 
That too, who would you package with it though? Devontae Graham? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't <laughs> think they need go. Devontae Graham after Jose Alvarado. They don't. Who needs Devontae team? Graham? Next. They there, are, there are some teams that could use Devontae Graham. Just off a spark plug off the bench. It's he just he be player. bugging sometimes though. Uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. I mean, yeah. They're in a good spot though. They're in like one of the the real good spots where they I don't see how they can make a mistake because even if they do trade Zion, they're gonna get a lot back. So for me, the Pelicans look really good. I think for Zion, though, like the situation is going to be. In Gr- I understand Griffin's point of view because it's like his health is a big concern. You know, he hasn't played much and his potential is sky high. But if he doesn't play, how much can you really bank on him? You know, you have Brandon Ingram who's sitting right there and you've seen when you give him the keys, he was great in the playoffs. You know, they won a couple games. CJ McCollum was a guy who stepped up big for them. Then, like I said, the undrafted guys, the guys who did get drafted late, they played impressive too. So it's really going to be up to Zion. But all in all, this is pretty good for the Pelicans, and I think Zion saying this means he's com- in a sense committed to at least trying it out. You know, saying if if not trying it out, take the money and at least try it for a year. You know, I think that guarantees them a year with Zion to see if it works. So that's where I'm at with this. One thing you didn't touch on: they're getting Zion back, You're but they're touch also on it, getting. I'm assuming. They're getting the duality of him and CJ. The last time he played his backcourt was Lonzo and Eric Bledsoe. And now you're bringing in CJ, who is the best perimeter player outside BI from the from that backcourt. And that shooting, the uh, you know, the dynamic ball handling, him slivering through pick and roll, that's something he has just not played with in the NBA or in college. So now you add that into the off- offense, and then defensively, they've added in several. I mean, Herb Jones is maybe the best defensive wing rookie I've ever seen. And then you have Jose Alvarado as well. Those two guys... Defensively, off the top of my head, you're way right. better. You're probably right. Off the top of my head, yeah, you're probably right. Like since, since maybe Kawhi, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you probably. Are Herb, right. jo- Herb Jones is a top three perimeter defender in the NBA right now. All right, come on. Who's better? Top three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Smart, Bridges, maybe Lou Dortz. He's Lou Dortz, not better. Um, well, Matisse Thibel, but does nothing offensively. So it's like I don't know. Just saying that, I would have I would to think take about Herb it. Jones. Well, because offensively, you wouldn't you take. Think, def- you think it's that far off between him and Marcus Smart? He just won Defensive Player of the Year. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but like, no, come, seriously. no, no, seriously, come on, no, <laughs> no, no. We, like, we bro, know, bro, we know. If Rob Will was healthy, he was gonna get that award. No, we, likely. no, we did it. Probably, <laughs> yeah, probably. Come, why are we? Why are we they, gonna they gave the show? it to Marcus Smart the show like they this? gave it to Marcus Smart because he was the best defensive player on the best defensive team, and Rob Will got hurt. Let's keep it a buck. Why are we doing? If Rob Will, if like Rob this, Will was bro. healthy, he probably wins. So you think why. Herb, Herb Jones top three defender in the league right now? No, Wayne defender. If he's not top three, he's top Drew five. Holiday? Mar- Marcus like, Smart was out for game two, and so the Celtics did just fine. Drew Holiday is, is Drew, Drew Holiday or Herb Jones. I mean, he's a better one on one defender, but like in total, like Herb Jones is length and athleticism. I mean, so you're talking versatility. I can say bam. Well, we're not talking about bigs. I was talking about Wayne defenders. I mean. Bam perimeter play, yeah. defenders. Perimeter defenders. Drew. Point of attack. Well, defenders. Point of attack is Drew. Okay, he's top five. So <laughs> I right. would take Drew. I respect Marcus Smart. <laughs> um, Bridges, you have to take Bridges, Bridges. Yeah, Herb Jones is top five, bro. That's fair. He's right. better. I think he's a better defender than Dybul and Dort. Well, Matisse. I mean, Dybul. They're like the same. It's just offensively, Herb Jones is better. It's way better. Yeah, I think defense. They're kind of built around the same thing, though. Honestly. That's that's a t- all right. I, I could dig with that. That was just like when you first hear it, it's like, oh, you know, that's facts, though. I've never seen that from like well, he's 22, 23, 23. Right? Yes, I mean, you kind of would hope, even though you're a second round pick, you would hope he'd be NBA ready from the jump. He clearly is. You have him and Jose defensively, it's way better than way better than what it was with Eric Bledsoe and Alonzo. Isn't that Alonso's weird in the NBA how first round picks tend to be more project players and then later round play, later picks tend to be guys that you expect to be ready right away? Because the later picks are usually the older guys, the guys who the play three to four years, yeah, the guys who play three to four years, you know, the guys who go to the playoff teams because you don't want youth on the playoff team because they can't develop. Did I not spit facts, though, about Rob Will and the DPOI thing? He would have been most I, likely to win. I didn't touch on that because I don't want to get in get into the back and forth with that. You know that was true, though. And I honestly don't know. Because if Rob Will did was, was healthy, I think he would have got probably mm-hmm. the notch. Honestly, I'm going to be real. If he probably was healthy, Bridges would have got it. Okay. Bridges would have probably got it. So you're it telling been. me that they only gave it to Smart because of the injury plus. Well, it's just best him, him getting hurt. On the best team, him getting hurt team. probably made it made him Marcus Smart stand out a little more. But yeah, since they're did. both, it's like when you have two MVPs on the same team, you can't give it to one. You know, so they probably would have gave it to Bridges. Well, yeah, I could, I could see that. I mean, 
listen with with me and Zion in this report and what Zion said. I've said it on the show all along. I've never said once whenever there was reports about Zion wanting out. I always questioned where are these coming from? What's the validity of this source? Can we really trust it? Does Zion really want out? Because all he's ever said is that he wants to be in New Orleans. He's never demanded a trade. And I think this year, this has been an odd year, I think, in terms of NBA reporting and how they've been reporting on players. Zion is hurt, and all of a sudden, the media covers him as if he quit on his team. The same thing with Ben Simmons. We just saw him get back surgery. We'll talk about that later. Ben Simmons is hurt, and the narrative around him is that he quit on his team. The reporting is very, this season has been very sloppy in how we cover these players. Zion was away from the team. He didn't text CJ because he was dealing with his foot injury. He was rehabbing, and usually you're not with the team when you're dealing with that sort of type of injury. I never thought Zion wanted out of the Pelicans. I think he wants to be there. He was quoted, and he said, just seeing the potential, we got a lot of great young pieces. I'm excited to get mm-hmm. on the court with these guys. And they do. CJ playing point guard, B.I., Zion, Herb Jones, Valanciunas. This past season, this team was my pick to be the surprise team of the NBA. But then we heard Zion wasn't going to play. And I said, you know what? I'm switching Minnesota. We know how right I turned out on that. I think the Pelicans will be the surprise team of the NBA next season. With Zion, I don't know how much of a surprise it's going to be because I think you can make the argument they were a surprise this season making the playoffs and taking Phoenix to six games. But they're going to be a top six, te- top six team in the, in, the, in the West. And with Zion on this team, the sky's the limit. Offensively, I don't worry much about it. Zion is one of those players that can fit with anybody. He's not a ball-dominant player. Stan Van Gundy played him in that role in his second season, and then he had a historic year. But as a rookie, he played off the ball, and he averaged 20. I think Zion can play off the ball, on the ball. He's going to be a great roller. He's going to be a great offensive rebounder and get a lot of put-back baskets. Defensively is where I worry. How is he going to fit into the culture that the Pelicans have built defensively? But I think he'll do, he'll do just fine. I mean, he's a freak athlete. He'll figure it out. It's funny because usually the freak athletes are the ones that struggle the most with defensive instincts and stuff like that when they're the ones who should be locking up everybody. It's kind of crazy. I think Zion has the instincts, though. Shot blocking, his instincts as a blocker. I think he has the wrong instincts, honestly. I don't like shot blocking is like okay, but like I feel like on the perimeter, he he really struggles like a lot. And it it shouldn't be the case because his recovery speed is kind of crazy. But I don't know. That's that's tough. That's your sleeper team. That's the team. He struggles because his feet are slow. He's also just kind of lost a lot of the time too on that end, and he can't move well in space a lot of the time with guards. So oh, they're they your do. surprise team in 2023. Does that include the postseason or just the regular season, like Memphis at the gate this year, or the Knicks and the Hawks last year? You can't really predict postseason success until you see matchups. So I'll say it's a regular season surprise team. It's going to be a team. Are they really going to surprise anybody though? That's why I said I don't I don't think they will because they already put people on notice with what they did in the playoffs, it's specifically B.I. People already see the Pelicans coming right now. Last year, nobody saw Minnesota. Uh, I'm trying to think of another team that nobody Cleveland. saw Memphis making this big of a jump. Nobody saw Cleveland making a playoff <laughs> push. Pel- people are going to expect things out of the Pelicans, especially if Zion is healthy. But they should live up to all those expectations. A Jonas Valanciunas Zion front court defensively sounds like a nightmare. That's why I say that. That totally sounds too awful. Uh, that does. Uh, it does. It, <laughs> why is why is Jonas Valanciunas in New Orleans right now? What happened when he was with No Jaron was like in and out of the lineup in the twenty twenty one series against Utah, but like Jonas was barbecue chicken on defense. It's getting cooked. Him and Grayson Allen. Grayson Allen got traded to Milwaukee. What's going on, with Grayson Allen right now? Jalen Brown was cooking him in game two. Not just say LeBron against Grayson <laughs> Allen, though. Well, Valanciunas is a weird guy to me. I don't know. I, I feel like sometimes... He's a walking double-double. Yeah, but I feel like sometimes in the series, they tried to force him, force the ball t- to him in certain mismatches, and it just didn't work. Like, it just wasn't their offense. So maybe they could package him, you know. Jackson DeAndre, is good. DeAndre and outplayed Valanciunas. Oh, clearly. But, but there were games where Valanciunas was giving it to him, too. 
Yeah, yeah the rebounding, obviously. Would so, you start Hayes at the five? No, he's more at four. That was where he was best this year. That's where he was at his best, but I think he's starting to develop into yeah, you, you, It depends on that five. three ball, how much his, his shot develops, I would say. Yeah, I mean, I think they have a lot of lineup versatility. Mance was good at the five in spurts. A small, yeah, he was. Mance was really I mean, the good. Pelicans have a lot of options, and Valanciunas, I think he's a free agent, if not this season, next season. Next. So because of that, they have options on what to do this offseason. They have all the talent, though. I think in terms of their wings, Trey Murphy, Herb Jones, they're going to develop nicely. Yeah. They already have B.I. The missing piece is, is simply Zion for them to take that next step. That And I think he will be that guy for them. You know, I know everybody wants to rag on Zion, but, I mean, when he played, he was historic. Would you go get a Miles Turner? I feel like Miles Turner is a name that gets brought up whenever a team's looking for a center. Because I feel like that's just like the blueprint of a defensive center that can shoot. So I always just say him. But like a type of player like him, you know? Yeah, if they can get him, I think that would be huge. Because you for could them maybe package Valentunas in a pick, throw it at Indiana, like, hey, look, you know, we, we're ready to compete. You're not, clearly. We'll give you this pick and Valentunas. You can free off some cat. Give us miles. There's but. more picks to unload, certainly. Oh, all yeah. right. Look, beautiful. And I don't even think the Pelicans could use the first round pick they have currently. Unless maybe they get Jalen Durant, J- Jalen Duran. He, he could possibly fall. Even not even him, they can get somebody else. Another a point guard, Tata Washington. Oh God, they already have Carol Lewis. He doesn't play. Please don't get Ty Ty. <laughs> Please don't. <sighs> no, I think the Pelicans roster as it is now, they don't need to add another. They rookie. got like eight nine guys right now. Yeah, they unless don't they need to add another. Well, if rookie. they trade Devonte, they can bring up. I don't. They'll have like they'll have a lottery pick if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, they'll have a lottery pick. So. They're Charlotte's too, so they got to. Oh my God, damn! So they can definitely package that for for a prime time player. Yeah, All would you, would you bring center. in another prime time player? I mean, I'm talking about like a Miles Turner, oh, yeah. you know. Like, my fault. You said prime time. I think <laughs> he's. <laughs> yeah, they got. They got. They you don't got, think he's prime time? Nah, prime time is crazy. Miles is like he's been Miles forever. They'll be good though. Pelicans are in a great position. I ain't going front. Like they're in a really great position. Yeah. Talking about player movement. Zach Levine. I mean. No, this is near and dear to your heart as a Bulls <laughs> fan. I mean, we all kind of realized they weren't going to do anything in the playoffs. You know, I'm glad you guys made it. But, man, if Zach Levine leaves Chicago, mm. you guys are in for other drought. And, you know, if I was him, I'd leave. Where'd you, where would <laughs> you go? I think it's simple. I'll name the teams in a bit, but I, th- I think it's simple because why wouldn't he leave the Bulls? Why wouldn't he? All the reasons point towards him leaving. To where? You have DeMar DeRozan, who's 32, who just had an outlier season. This isn't the DeMar we've we've grown accustomed to over the past couple of years. He's never averaged 27 before? He hasn't done it in like four four, four or five years. So this is an outlier season. Everybody around DeMar DeRozan's age, Zach Levine looks around. Westbrook regressing. Harden regressing. DeMar is probably next. Lonzo Ball can't play a full year. He's going to at least miss half the season. Mm. And Vucevic is a free agent after next year. So Zach Levine's looking like there's this team really doesn't have a way up. Mm. Because of that, let me leave in free agency. And he said, I understand the relationship I've had with Ak in the, in the last five years here. I hope the city understands how much I care about the Bulls. I'm going into everything open-minded, but knowing how much I've enjoyed my time here. To me, it sounds like he's leaving. So where? And then he says, you guys have really had a soft spot in my heart. That's like the dagger. Yeah. You know, when somebody says that to you, like, you know, you've been such a great friend to me. You kind of know it. The friendship's about to end. Zach Levine is leaving Chicago. Where's I'm going to say that now. Where's he going? And he could take Derek Jones Jr. with him. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you say that? He can. I mean, he's 24. He's young, too. You thought we was going to care about Yeah, this. why the hell did you <laughs> say Derrick Jones Jr.? Um, He's a good player. I'm going to be honest with you guys. This is like, this is this is really an interesting situation because li- realistically, I'm looking at free agency and there's only two teams that make sense in my mind. San Antonio, for, this is for Zach, San Antonio and Detroit. You know, I look at Detroit, you got Cade, you got Sadiq Bey, you got, you're going to probably have a top four pick. That's good. You're going to have Cap. Why not? 
bring in a, a scorer who's still young. And then I look at San Antonio, pairing him with DeJounte Murray, the culture they're building over there. But I look at Detroit's situation, and it's like that's probably better than San Antonio because I feel like Cade's probably going to be better than DeJounte Murray down the line. And Dwayne Casey's there. You know, they have Sadiq Bey who really improved. They're going to be a good team. They have Cap also. But you don't want to start Killian Hayes? Oh, God, he's... But I don't think he's leaving. I really don't think so. I think this is his first time as a star valuing free agency. I don't mind him going around and looking at options. But I think if he wants to compete and still be in a competitive team, I don't see why he would leave. I also don't see why he would leave $50 million on the table. You know, I think if you're signed under clutch, you're all about your money. You're not all about getting paid to die. So I don't think leaving $50 mil on the table makes sense for he him. He can't get a super max, though. No, but he can get a max. Okay. He can't get the same amount of money from another team as he can from us. That's why. Yeah. We're the only team that can pay him that type of money. Zach also said that he's willing to take a pay cut to win. Which which to is add great. Players. Which yeah. is incredible for us if he stays. But I mean you said you said DeMar is declining. I don't see that. You know, his game No, I didn't say he's declining. I said, how much longer is this gonna last? I mean, his contract's only two years left. And I think next year I think like with Zach, everything's about him getting healthy. You know, I think he has to get healthy. I think if he stays, you know, we, we still have a lot of young talent. You know, so I think if he stays, he can see what the what we built here in the span of two years. AK's only been hired for like two seasons. And what he did in two years, I think he can trust that AK done a great job. He's put the team next to him. And if he doesn't see that here, I don't mind him going to venture out to San Antonio, going to venture out to Detroit. But my gut's saying he's going to stay and he's going to continue to play for our team. Now, this what I want. You told me to give my teams. Teams that have cap space, Pistons, Pacers, OKC, I don't think any of those will happen. The team you're sleeping on is Portland. They have cap space. They can make a run at Zach Levine. If he... if he, Where is he from? No, I know he's from there. But it's, it's just like... Seattle, but... Does it make normal. sense? I'm not saying it makes sense, but I think he probably looks at Portland versus Chicago, and he might say... That's a better situation to win with Dame. I'd rather play with Dame than with DeMar. So he'd rather go play with another dominant ball that's handler. That's better. That's also aging because you, you throw up the age yeah, factor. Dame, no, 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 no. Dame, no. You, no, no his keep game this. can age well, though. So can DeMar's. I'm not saying they can't, but I, I would much rather bank my money on Dame. But no, no, no. Don't play the, don't play the favorite card. You said age is a factor. Dame is older than DeMar. Dame is just Dame is coming off for an abdom, uh, abdominal yeah. injury, mm-hmm. so you're looking at the and and Anthony Simmons is also Simons. Pardon me, I don't know how to say his name. Such a free agent, yeah. Simons, but he's also yeah. there. So this is another guard ascending. Plus they have a draft pick. But Simons is not a two. He's gonna he's a one. So where's Dame? Dame is gonna start. So where's is that gonna start? You're gonna, gonna put start. Zach at the three. No, you put Zach. At, Simons comes off the bench. Also, oh, Simons, who's just been yeah. productive at at yes, starting, he can put on the bench. The bench. Or they can trade him for a prime time player if they want to go all in and win. I mean, right now, I think they're Dame, Levine, mm-hmm. and Josh Hart sounds really good. Sounds okay. I think the those first three, they need to figure out that front court. But all I'm saying, if I'm Zach, Portland is an intriguing situation. And then these are some other ones. Dallas is a, is an option. They would have to sign and trade for Zach, though. I'm not sure how that worked. Atlanta's an option. What it? What would you think about this sign and trade? Because it would be have to be. It would have to be a sign and trade. Zach Levine, yeah. for John Collins and Bogdan Bogdanovich and a pick. Bro, are you serious? <laughs> John Collins? He, he solves you. I'm just asking you. What you, you, tr- you got to be trolling? No, I'm just <laughs> that. That would be that. Would, that matches sal- that matches the salary. But you, you're gonna send this John. So you want us to play John and Collins picks. and Vooch? I mean, your lineup would be Lonzo Bogdanovich, DeRozan, Collins, and, and Vooch. Vooch. That doesn't sound awful. Or Zach can leave for nothing. Well, he won't go to Atlanta. He won't go to Atlanta, but he can definitely leave for nothing. Would you rather have him leave for nothing or get nothing? Get, get John Collins in return? And get nothing. Other? John Collins is not nothing, bro. That, come on, that's a three. That's a that's a three year. That's a guy who's on like a three year contract who doesn't fix anything. He's a good defender. He can he can floor, space the floor. You gotta be trolling with that trade. Ain't no way you serious with that trade. I don't. I don't think I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't accept that. If we're gonna sign in trade, it have to be something good. Well, he's not restricted for agents. So you're not accepting it. No, like I'm saying like when he's talking about like Atlanta. If Atlanta yeah. wants, if he says, if he, if Zach comes out and says, "Oh, I want to go to Dallas," then obviously it would have to be a sign in trade. The Lakers, I'm not acknowledging. Westbrook sign in trade. 
Oh my god! <laughs> what would you do if you get Westbrook? I'd probably not be a Bulls fan. You serious? I'm dead serious. Okay, so the realistic situations, in my opinion, are Portland. Mm. I like San Antonio. I think is a good fit too. I think San Antonio makes a lot of sense. Portland, San Antonio, and Atlanta. Yeah, I think those three teams are teams that I, I think they're all in a better position going forward than Chicago. Atlanta. Trey Young. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. With that roster. With Zach on it, Trey Young, Zach, and Capella? No, I'm saying if Zach is looking at both of our situations, he's thinking Atlanta's in a better spot than us. Because of Trey, yes. They're younger. Are they? Much younger, yeah. I mean, they're core. Anyeka Kanwu, I mean, I think Clint Capella, great. I think Clint Capella's game. I just feel like they have they have a lot of guys under big contracts. That's why I say they're not like in a better like Danilo's getting paid twenty. Then you got Bogdan or oh, Bogey, he's getting paid eighteen. He's, he's a free agent after next year though. Inspiring. Yeah. Next year. Sheesh. Clint. You got to move Clint. Maybe you can get Bogdanovich, they gotta, Collins, and uh D-Lo. They're about to pay DeAndre Hunter about 12 to 15 mil. So there's that money. That's his price range, though. Yeah. That's, but that's, mo- that's more money coming in. I mean, Trey Young, Zach Levine, DeAndre Hunter, Onyeka, whoever the four is, that sounds like a better team than what you guys would have going forward. Lonzo, Zach. Who plays half the year. In. DeAndre Hunter is not exactly yeah, the most you, durable you, player you, in the NBA. Your bias is showing. I'm just saying. No, your bias no, I'm just is saying, showing. I'm just saying. DeAndre Hunter has missed back. He, he got hurt last year, and the year before, he barely played. Okay, I know what you're saying. But no, you're not. No, you don't. No, I am. <laughs> but I, I think Atlanta, Clint hurt the year before I think too? Atlanta's a better situation, though. Just because of Trey. Yes. They have the star. They That's what they need. Their and coaches. Uh, Atlanta needs a second star next to Trey. We saw it in these playoffs. Easily. Yeah, maybe. That's what they need. <laughs> but you think he's ultimately maybe. staying in Chicago? Yeah. You have that faith? Yeah. I mean, look at the teams you're naming. I don't think, like, anything was groundbreaking for me to, like, like if he's, like, no sign and trade makes sense. Like, in my opinion, no sign and trade makes sense. Like, if he's going to go, he's probably going to just walk away. And the teams you named that, like, Portland, I guess, because of Dame, you know, Josh, Josh Hart, they're going to have to bring him back. So that's a good one. Um, they got Simons over Scripture, so that's good too. Nurkish, they're gonna have to bring back. So they got a lot of guys. They got a few guys they gotta bring back. But oh no, I like Chauncey Billups in that situation. So that's that's cool. I didn't think even think of Portland and um, San Antonio. I think is a good spot too. My sleeper was Detroit, but I like all them signing trades. I don't think Dallas has anything to give us to get Zach. You know? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think so either. And I think Atlanta maybe, but it would have to be like the right type of movements for us to say yeah because they have a lot of guys on big contracts too so it's like it's tough you don't think a Jalen Brunson sign trade like they could probably make make that work one way or another with Jalen and then you throw in one of Josh Green um, we have four guards I mean he's a wing Jalen Brunson's not a wing that's about Josh Green no I'm saying we have four guards we're bringing in the fifth one I don't know ah, like it's like that's what I'm saying like, I don't I don't know I don't know. I think Dallas doesn't make sense here in a sign and trade. Just the players just don't make sense. Unless you're getting back Dinwiddie and um Tim Hardaway Jr. Tim Hardaway somebody Jr. else. No, I think I think he stays. I mean if you leave I think him. Zach Levine with Dallas though is oh, the oh, most oh, intriguing yeah, yeah, yeah. spot. Yeah. But they don't have anything to offer up. It's that's the biggest problem. That's the biggest barrier in this type of uh type of deal. Listen, I love Zach. No, you don't. I love, look, I, I love seeing you hopeful this year. You know, your team was finally back on the map, and <laughs> it, it was nice. I love seeing it. I'm mellow about it. Mm-hmm. I love mellow. seeing it, but uh, I told you, it wasn't going to last long. I so when, I think it's over this offseason. I mean, when he signs, I'll just, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to rub it in your face. I'm not going to be mean about it. I'm just going to say. So I what happens you. when he comes to the Knicks? Nobody's going there, bro. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, nobody. What happens going. when we sign and trade you Julius Randle? Julius Randle? He's going to Portland. That's what we'll send him. You think Zach, Zach Levine? No, Julius Randle. If he's getting traded anywhere and the Blazers are desperate, Joe Cronin, I can definitely see him trading for Julius. And I like, actually think if, if I were betting, I'd pick Zach Levine to go to Portland if I were betting. Mm. They have the cow space. He's from Seattle. He's from the area. Playing with Dame, I think, is more intriguing than staying with DeMar DeRozan. And they also have young pieces there where they can either flip for 
more established players, and they have they're gonna have a top draft pick in this year's draft. Yeah. So imagine having a team of Dame, Levine, Josh Hart, Boncaro, with a Nurkic. What if they sign and trade Anthony Simons to Detroit and they get Jeremy Grant? I doubt it happens, but it makes sense. What if Zach wants to play in a nice weather city? He's playing in Minnesota for five years or three. Well, yes, three years and then Chicago for five years. He's living in a mansion. I don't think it matters. I don't know. He grew up in the Pacific Northwest. Like maybe you'd want to live. He's from L.A. Like he lives in L.A. currently. Okay. He lives in L.A. currently. During the season. I don't know. Just a thought. Yeah, he lives in L.A. currently, so that's why the Lakers rumors swirled up. He but said, I, he, I doubt that he said in a, one time in twenty twenty, he said in an interview, "I would love to play for the Lakers." That's what it surfaced up. We were garbage at that time, so you know how they, you know how they do it. They try to spin it like, "Oh, Lakers trade." They have nothing, literally nothing, to give us. Tht and West, Westbrook. They keep trying to throw that package. <laughs> <laughs> that's like fifty seven million dollars right there. Tht and Westbrook. That would definitely revive the Lakers again, though. Oh, yeah, undoubtedly. With LeBron, Levine, and AD. Just got to pick up guys not named Trevor Ariza. It'll be okay. Yeah, some young wing defenders. Danny Green? Yep. God damn. I think so. It'll be in shambles. So last time, John, you were on the show, you were very critical of uh, one thing in specific that I remember, and that was the Utah Jazz's defense. I remember you saying, quote for quote, they're fundamentally broken. You were very harsh on the Utah Jazz, very passionate, very harsh. Very indictive. So, um, I want to ask you, the Utah Jazz are going through a dilemma right now. <laughs> they just lost in the first round. It's horrible for them. Rudy Gobert called out Mitchell. Now, what side do you lean on? Gobert or Mitchell? Neither. You don't you don't you don't like either one. Why did Danny Ainge come here? <laughs> what's his plan? What's Dan what's Danny Ainge known for? He's cold hearted. I'll trade both. I'll trade Quinn Snyder too. I'll trade everyone. You can trade a coach. You can't trade. A He's coach, done it yeah. before. Yo, that's crazy. I didn't know that. Doc, I, I've seen people talk about they can trade coaches. I was did, so confused. How did Doc get to LA? I thought he just wow. Danny traded him. I don't want to say he's going to do it with Quinn Snyder too, but if the Lakers want a coach, and I mean the Lakers need a lot of things, nothing is off the table. I don't know what's going to happen with Donovan. What he wants. Ultimately, it comes down to how him and Rudy get along. And everyone deserves blame. Like the Jazz, with Donovan Mitchell being so good so early, they did not build this team with top 10 picks. Their only top 10 picks were Rudy Gay, Mike Connolly, maybe somebody else. So they didn't get any Did shots. you say Rudy Gay? Yeah, Rudy Gay, top 5 pick. Or top 10 pick, yeah. Wasn't he? He maybe was, not. but now with you, Maybe not. Not with well, Utah. that's what I'm saying. They brought them in. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was like, yeah. fuck. I think but he was, was way past pick, his right? prime. Yeah. Exactly. That's the point. He's coming off foot surgery. I'm talking about top 10 picks on the team. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. So they didn't get any shots in the 2019-2018 draft to get a Luka Doncic, right? And with that, the team could only be as good as the sum of its parts. So they bring in Boyan Bogdanovich in free agency. Really good move. Mike Connolly, really good move. But he was 31 at the time. And I was telling you guys, I'm like, Mike Connolly and Joe Ingles, both of them are older. Joe Ingles came into the training camp out of sheep, was terrific last year, was not the same player this year. Mike Connolly in the playoffs, do you guys see him? I, he, he wasn't out there, wasn't playing well at all. Um, and now they're stuck. They gave a pretty nice extension in the 2021 offseason. This team is not going anywhere past the first round. I mean, I think it's it's done. <laughs> you, could, you can say maybe you trade Rudy and you keep Donovan Mitchell. Just blow the entire thing up at that point. You're not getting better if you trade Rudy Gobert. You're not. It's as simple as that. And then if you trade Donovan, I mean, you're not getting better either. So it's like it's a lose-lose. And what's Danny Ainge known for? Because he's around the show. He did not draft any of these players. This is the team he came in and took. Danny Ainge only does one thing. And to me, this thing's over. I mean, you talk about the Jazz not having a lot of <laughs> options to draft top players. Toronto was in the same position, and Toronto found gems in Fred and Pascal, OG late. So I'm not giving the Jazz a pass for not having top draft picks because they could have drafted Herb Jones instead of Jared Butler. We're honest, and, they, and then and and they chose Jared Butler because of because of that. To be fair, we thought it was a good pick. I, I like Jared Butler. I like him as a player. Where they got him, it was a good value pick. But what they needed, we we, we were vouching for them to draft Kessler Edwards which would have been a better pick for them. What I'm saying is that 
I'm not giving him the benefit of the doubt for not having top picks. Rudy Gobert reported by Real OC Sports, which Rudy Gobert called out this report and said, every day there's new rumor. But this report says Rudy Gobert is at a him or me point with Donovan Mitchell and will demand that one of them be traded in the next few days. Rudy feels that his own numbers are consistent or getting better while Don is is de- a defensive liability and falling off in terms of explosiveness. Now, my first thoughts on this are that Rudy Gobert demanding anything is ridiculous. <laughs> I'll trade his ass tomorrow <laughs> he does that shit to me. I've been saying it from the beginning. They need to blow this team up. But Rudy Gobert is not wrong. Donovan Mitchell doesn't play defense. Donovan Mitchell's explosiveness is not the same it was a year or two years ago. That ankle injury has been, has, you can see it's kind of lingering on. And I'm siding with Rudy Gobert. Like, I, I don't think the Jazz should keep him, but he's been holding, he's been holding this defense afloat for two to three seasons now while all the parts around him are garbage. He's been holding them and making them a consistent top 10 defense in the NBA. Mitchell's coming off of one of his worst playoff performances. Every year he's gotten worse defensively. And I meant it when I said it a couple shows ago that I think he's plateaued. That that instant success as a rookie, we had high expectations for him. But now we see this is the player he is. He's a high volume scorer. That's not a that's an average playmaker. That's a below average defender. And you can't win a championship with that guy being your best player on your team. There's headline headlong drives where his vision is just like not good enough to be a primary point guard. They tried making him one and he showed some progression, but he's just not that guy. You touched on the the margin or I, I want to touch on the margin of error. You said the Raptors, they snagged OG and OB, Pascal, Freddie went undrafted. The margin of error is very narrow when you don't have the top 10 picks. How many teams draft as well as Toronto? You say that, but then I can also counter that and say, We've seen a team like Atlanta have these shots and they drafted a DeAndre Hunter, which has been a disappointment thus far. They drafted a Cam Reddish, who they just traded, who they thought could become a star. And then Onyeka was the other lottery pick, too. which Kevin Herter, I, I love Onyeka, so I'm not going to say nothing bad about him, but they missed on their top draft picks. And you know, it's crazy. They've all been hurt. Onyeka, Hunter, Cam, nagging injuries, year in, year out. First of all, because oh, Rudy's comments is funny. <laughs> I agree with you. What the, who the hell is he to say that he can demand anything? Like, that's it. Certain players, I understand when LeBron walks up in the office, Kevin Durant, you know, even Luca. I, I get it, bro. You're that guy. I understand. You can walk in here. You can demand things. But, you know, for him to say Donovan Mitchell hasn't gotten better when Rudy Gobert is in year 10 with no offensive game is still kind of crazy to me. Like, you can knock Donovan for not getting better. Okay, that's fair. But how you saying you've gotten better is kind of weird to me. Defensively, you're fucking amazing. You know, you're incredible. You're this historically great def- defender. Offensively, you're still not good. You have not been good since you've walked in the league. Sometimes you miss dunks. There's literally a reason why at 7-3, it's hard to pass to you because sometimes you don't make layups. So it's like, I don't, I don't, I don't understand his comments because Donovan Mitchell. Like, in the playoffs, I get it. Sometimes he's he's tunnel vision. You know, sometimes he is inefficient. But one thing's for sure, he comes to play. He, he does put his best efforts in Rudy Gobert. Like, I, like you said, I think they do need to blow it up in general. Both of them don't need to be there. They should, you know, kill the whole thing. But it's like you're looking at Donovan, you're looking at Rudy. If you trade Rudy, can Rudy honestly get better if he leaves? Yeah. Put him with Luka, Trey, one of those guys. How is he getting better, though? That's, I don't think he's getting you said better. Luke, if, I leave, if Donovan leaves, I think he can still get better as a basketball player. You did say Rudy is a bad offensive player. He has no bag. I get that. But no, the he has Jazz, no post up. Well, yeah, that's what I mean. The Jazz are the best offense in the game last season, and they built their offense around his strengths and weaknesses. So it's like, can you build an elite top one? Okay. No, I was going to say you, can, you can't build an, a top one or top three defense with Donovan, but you can because you have Rudy Gobert. Yeah, please don't. Yeah. Oh, wait, what, what do you mean? I was you can't, say, though. You, you can't, can't build a top defense around Donovan Mitchell. Well, yeah, obviously. But like, yeah. you can have him in as a starter as the number one option offensively in a top one, top three defense. The Jazz were a great offense last year. 
I know that Rudy Gobert's rim running had a lot to do with it, but it also helped that you had 40% shooters all around the court, and what they do is shoot a ton of threes. So I'm not going to credit Rudy Gobert for making their offense so great. I think he was a big part of it, but I think he doesn't get better as a player, but his numbers get better. I think with Luka, he averages 20 and 15. He does not average 20 He doesn't have a great-A playmaker. He does not average 20 points. Easily. Rudy Gobert would never. With Trey Young, he can average 20. No. Two. He's yeah. he's gonna he no, he's not. Mm-hmm. How is he gonna average twenty points? He averages like seventeen right now. No, he doesn't. He averages fifteen and fifteen. He's gonna average fifteen. So he can't average five more points. Yo, are you serious? With Luca. Do you, you think Rudy's getting twenty a game? <laughs> <laughs> yo, this yo, you guys are crazy. He's at sixteen. you you don't think you get to eighteen or nineteen. He's not, easily he's not gonna be a twenty and fifteen guy. He he's already 16. You're telling me four he's points be, this is, is a big difference. No, I'm telling you, this is what he, he's going to. This is what this is what Rudy Gobert is, bro. Four points, four more points in an offense that is going to pass him the ball more. He had Ricky Rubio before, bro. He was still putting up 16 a game, bro. Ricky Rubio is not Trey Young as a passer. But he's still a great. Pa- he's still a great passer. He's not Luka Doncic or Trey Young. He's not. No, I'm not saying he is. But he still had a great playmaker, but and he's gonna. He still puts up the regular there's numbers. There's a huge difference in those offensive weapons. Yes. And if you put it in a vacuum, the passing of Ricky Rubio is not that far behind, but the threat, the dual threat of Luca or Trey Young is off the charts when you're going to compare it to Ricky Rubio. So you're telling me, so wait. Players okay. play up more on Luca and Trey Young in pick and roll situations, which makes lobs more open than a Rubio. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought she was going to go uh, with Donovan. They're just way better offensive talents. No, I agree. But Donovan I mean, doesn't I, even pass it when it's a lob opportunity. I, I just, I don't think, I don't think he's going to, like, he's going to be what Clint Capella with better defense, but he's going to put up the same exact numbers. I, I don't understand why you guys think he's going to put up 20 points a game. That's kind of ridiculous. I don't, 20 I don't, and 15 His strength is offensively is as a vertical threat. You pair him with one of those lob throwers. Yeah. I mean, he can easily get the 18 or 19 a game, which isn't 20, but it's right there. I mean, I don't see it. I really don't. I think he's going to be 15 and 15 for his life. Like, I don't, maybe, uh, I don't know. He can get a few more points. I don't think so, bro. I really, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. What is he, 30 he's years scrapping. old? 30? What do you go back? He's going to turn, yeah, yeah. He's going to turn 30. Yep. I don't see it. 15 and 15. He got to show me. That's that's something he's just realistically got to show me. And I get it. Trey Young, Luca, Universal. The Melo Ball, too, I didn't mention. But yeah, him, he would be in that okay, category. Yeah. Yeah. Trey Young, Lamelo. Uh, Luca, universal plas- passers. Twenty and fifteen from Rudy just looks off, but maybe. I mean, I mean, it depends on how good the team is. Well, they would have to, you know, like you guys are saying, you, just, you guys are just like DeAndre Ayton hasn't averaged twenty yet in his career, but he can average twenty. He's also much younger, and he has. I know, a, he has but a better, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying game, is that DeAndre Ayton hasn't averaged twenty because he's playing with multiple players that can score, and that do score. You have Chris Paul, D. Book, Cam Johnson off the bench, Mikael Bridges. Can, yeah, but yeah. Jake, like they all take shots. But you can also him. give it to Aiden and trust that he can go get a bucket. No, I know, I okay. know, it's, I know. It's, it's what, I, what, I, what I'm just saying is that if you, if Rudy Gobert well, is thrust into Atlanta and he, to be fair, and it's a one-two punch, you can't just. Well, to be fair, Rudy's also point. getting paid forty plus, so this isn't just a thrust guy into. This is you're giving up a lot to get a Rudy Gobert type of player. Where, where? So, <laughs> or just you're giving up a con- giving up contracts. Which is a lot because they, they can Atlanta, they can real, Atlanta can realistically do what all their guys are contracts. Danilo Gallinari is getting twenty mil. They're not good. Okay, throw another guy. So Danilo, uh-huh. and then they can throw in <laughs> a John Collins, Boyan Bogdanovich, eighteen Bogdanovich. million. So them they three. can throw in that's Gallo Bogdanovich. You would give okay, so that's their three guys. Or they they can actually just give up Gallo and Capella for a Gobert, and add a match the contracts. I think it would. No, it won't. Why not? Capella's making like 18 mil. Why would Utah do that? Utah do it? Because Gallo Utah because Utah is in a... You're literally getting a lesser version of Rudy Gobert. No, I know, but it's not forever. What I'm basically saying is I think John <laughs> Collins would have to be That's not that. like... I'm just, I'm just trying... Rudy is. I'm just talking about contracts. I don't think Atlanta's going to give up John Collins from Rudy, bro. I don't think that's happening. Because then what happens to Capella? I think Capella would have to be in the deal, and they'd probably ship out Capella to another... It would be a three-team deal. They're shipping out Capella to another team, and then Utah just gets draft picks. But they can make it work contract wise with a deal like that. Oh, totally. Yeah. So that's what, what I'm about, saying. What about um um? What about who? No, never mind. 
So yeah, he's due. I was looking at his contract. Yeah, he's due for forty one million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, he's he's over. You better watch out if you better watch out, man. I'm if he not worried. if he goes with Trey Young and then Zach comes to town, they won't have the money to do that. I don't know. They literally won't. Zach wants to take a pay cut, right? Take a pay cut. They don't have money to even get a pay cut. <laughs> Go to Atlanta. That would have to be that would have to be like two signing trades. I don't like. I don't know. I feel like both guys deserve blame. Well, everybody. Just, Mike Conley was garbage. Um, yeah, everybody deserves blame. Mike Conley was horrible. <laughs> yeah, he he traveled at the end of one of the games. It was really bad. He looked I mean, old. The entire that team was horrible. They couldn't guard anybody. And their offense is but lost in the series in the end. They're a league leading offense because their defense oh, was awful. That was a great deal. play call by Quinn Snyder. Logan just missed the three. Like it was yeah. wide open. That was the thing that Jared Butler too. Like. Quinn Snyder didn't play him. I was like, can I like see what Jared Butler looked like? He had one of his like really good uh game, I think it was like some point in March or February, and Quinn Snyder like didn't play him after that. I was like, bro, I'll just try him. He, <laughs> he was celebrating did. on the bench. Yeah, I saw like when they were in the huddle and it was heated, he was actually just laughing and chilling. I actually do think that if they re- nothing else to do, if they do rebuild and retool, and I think Jared Butler starts. I think he put up some numbers. Like, okay. like 15, 15, five, yeah. 15 like, 16. Good defense. Jared yeah. Butler, yeah, yeah. I think he could they have, you know what's crazy? be in an I MIP. Think, I, think the, like, I think their rebuild won't take that long, honestly, if they just make the right moves now. I, I don't think it would take that long. If they it prolong long. it, it's, it's yeah, not, like, they're I never going to You know, they can it. still, like Jordan Clarkson, I feel like still has some value that you can get like a late first or second round pick out of him. Like he's his contract isn't crazy. It's like $14 million. What would you think of Portland... Signing Levine, then trading, let's say in Nurkic, and then the pick for Gobert. They would have to re-sign Nurkic, and then having Levine, Damon, Gobert, and Josh Hart. Let's look at, let's look at Portland's situation. They've got like four or five players in the box. Because I think Portland's going to get two primetime players in this free agency. I think Julius really Randall will be like the most likely option Please stop for them. Saying his name. I'm, I'm, just saying that's they're not going to get Julius Randall. They're not going to. So get him. the Blazers have approximately sixty four million dollars to play with. Yep. Rudy's that's two. Due. That's two maxes basically. No, 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 no. You just said trade for Rudy. Rudy's a super max. That's forty one million dollars. If Zach is serious about taking a pay cut, that means he'll be getting about twenty three million dollars. Right. They can move off of Eric Bledsoe too, though. He's getting no. This is all. This is all. This is like if they bring the the guys they want to bring back because their cap estimated is at one twenty two mil, but they'll have about sixty four to play with. So if they get Rudy, you know he cuts that damn near a half, and then if Zach is serious about a pay cut, he'll get about twenty four million dollars. Yeah, I think Portland is in the best position to make serious moves this off season and then be back in the mix of things in the playoffs next year. I still don't get exactly why Zach would want to go to Portland, but you don't think it's better in Chicago. He's, I mean, just would you rather play? You. Would you rather leave Chicago, which is a much bigger market for Portland? With you don't know who the GM's going to be, no idea. Um, you don't know how good the coach is. You may like John C. Billups, but I mean, like Billy Donovan's like one of the better coaches, I would say, in the NBA. You at least know with him. I really don't see it. And you're playing in a much harder conference. I mean, he spent his first three years in Minnesota where that was tough. Why would he want to go back? You know? Ask this guy. <laughs> I think Portland sounds better. Yeah, look, see? Yeah, poor, I, yeah I mean, sure. Chicago, yeah, they had a good run this year, but teams are good, are, are bouncing back. Like, sure, well, the Knicks are going to bounce back. It's nothing against Portland. I've never been there, but I don't know the why he would want to go there. The what? The Knicks. How are you bouncing back? We're going to make the playoffs this upcoming season. Yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> RJ Barry, year four. All right. You saw what he did in the second half of the season. You saw you how he competed against that? teams like Miami. Do you know what they call that? Delusion. No, we call that empty calories. No, we call that improvement. Empty calories doesn't exist, bro. That doesn't exist. RJ Barrett was efficient and he was doing it. Twenty four points. Put some respect on RJ Barrett's name. I know you're not a big RJ fan, but put some respect on his name. I like RJ. Put some respect on him. And we got Quentin Grimes too. And he Maybe. might be traded, so we'll see. I mean, what if we trade for a problem? You never know. I'm just saying, I don't think Chicago, the outlook on them isn't, I'm not too high on their outlook. That's not me being a Chicago hater. What if they try to go for Anthony Davis? The Bulls or the yeah. Knicks? The Bulls, not the Knicks. 
how would they go for Anthony Davis? Nikola Vucevic is expiring contract. You throw in Kobe White because maybe you don't want to pay Kobe White. And you think the Lakers with Anthony with LeBron James are going to do it? I doubt it. Uh, I've seen some pretty stupid stuff from them. So you think LeBron? I mean, LeBron has a co-sign every move they make. You yeah. think he's going to be like, yes, trade AD for didn't Vucevic it, and Kobe White? Didn't LeBron kind of force their hand to trade for Russell Westbrook when it really wasn't going to fit at all? Right. Okay, but do you think that he's going to trade AD for Vucevic? I, I didn't mean, say it. If, he said it. If Rob Palenka, <laughs> you know, wants to take you know they're not going to do it. Hands. They're not going to do it. If Rob Palenka sees LeBron, <laughs> hey, maybe he wants to leave. And I don't try know. To take I mean, I'm zone. still confused in the Portland thing, but it's a nice place, nice area. I you think know. Portland has a lot of a lot of what room to make moves. I don't. I don't think their position is uh, like. And Dame I, wants to stay in Portland. You're, look, you're looking at a team that you're looking at a conference that seven teams are automatically better than you, even if you get Zach. Not really. What if you get Jabari Smith? <laughs> <laughs> what if you get Shet? Shet doesn't move me. He probably uh, Shet doesn't move you, but Paolo does. No, I mean none of them move me as guys are going to do that. I mean. Good luck. Doesn't San Antonio have more than enough salary cap room as well? It'll no, get to San Antonio play for, can do it. Assuming Pop doesn't retire, I'll get to play for him for like a year or two. And they don't have to mm. give up nothing, really nothing, other than Lonnie Walker. Like those two Trailblazers first-round picks, they are lottery tickets, but that can amount to like very little. But You're right. But they can also amount for. to a lot. Luck of the draw. Look at the draw. And we'll know all where it amounts to, where where it leads up to before free agency. Yeah, and two so weeks. Zach will know what players they get. Yeah, because the draft. Uh, I don't think a rookie is moving him. I'm gonna be honest. With you. I don't think a rookie. I think is moving. Dame is though. Dame. I mean, not how, bro. Like, come on, it's Dame. There's a very good chance to try to package those two picks in a trade for like a, I don't know, because if you're getting Bradley Beal, that's the first guy that comes to mind. You're not getting Zach as well. That make no sense, but. I don't think Dame is moving anybody, bro. Nobody, he, nah, nobody's dude, I, went there, I understand. Bro. Like you are, you're still trying to uh, cope with. Uh, no, I literally said San Antonio was a better spot. The Bulls' playoff loss and the potential of losing Zach Levine. I understand Zach Levine losing or leaving would definitely hurt the Bulls, but I mean he's not going to Portland. Nah, <laughs> he's just, from the Pacific Northwest, but I mean. Doesn't, doesn't yeah, it doesn't really matter to people anymore. He's not going there, bro. I'm sorry. All right, we'll see. Talk about we'll see. They have no state right? income tax, right? So I guess there's that. But no. I was about to go play in Portland. Come on. <laughs> I think San Antonio would be number one. Maybe Detroit would be on that list. I think that's an interesting one. I like Detroit. Dallas. I actually genuinely like Detroit. Cade, Levine, City, Jeremy Grant, and whoever they bring in. I like at Detroit. the five. I think that'd be really cool. That's a good young core moving forward. I do like. A good young core moving forward also is the Minnesota Timberwolves. They have a great young core. Anthony Edwards, we know, is going to be a top player in this league for year, many, many, many years to come because he's just that good. Thirsky, that's the movement. Thirsky. That's his new thing? Yeah, Thirsky. Yeah, that's the movement. Um, they lost in the playoffs, and the player who disappointed the most in the series was D'Angelo Russell. He averaged 12 points, shot 33% from the field, 38% from three. Game six, he was unplayable. To the point that Jordan McLaughlin played over him. And Jordan McLaughlin ran the offense well. A lot of tempo, was really good defensively, paced himself, something that D Lo failed to do. D Lo failed to score 12 points or more in five of the six games. He scored 12 points or fewer in five of the six games in the playoffs. It was a major disappointment, and it saw a lead to the question. Should they trade D'Angelo Russell this offseason or should they run it back? I think they should run it back. You know, I think unless you're getting a star like caliber player back, which I don't think the market is pretty high for him, the way he just stunk it up, I don't really see why you should trade him. You know, I think coming off a year where they finally made the playoffs, it's been a long time. You know, since the Jimmy Butler era, and even then, it hasn't been consistent. You kind of want to keep the same. The, you kind of want to keep the same consistent culture in there for right now, just to build up that winning mentality. You know, build up that edge in the locker room. And plus, he's Cat's best friend. You know, I think you want to keep Cat ha- happy right now, and that's the first step in keeping Cat in town. You know, I think they had a good year. Pat Bev came in. D'Lo played well this year. He was a great leader for them this year. He. Did his job as a point guard in the regular season. I think in the playoffs, obviously, he didn't play too good. You know, he was pretty shitty. But 
in the same sense, they made the series competitive. So, you know, you look at it from that lens. If D'Lo plays a little bit better, then maybe we win the series. You know, maybe if we don't stink it up and choke three games, maybe we win the series. Because uh, I know D'Lo played horrible. I know. It. But it wasn't just him who was blowing those leads, too. So you got to kind of look at it as a whole. Like, yeah, D'Lo was bad, but we was bad in general, too, in a lot of those moments. So I think D'Lo should definitely give it, give it another year in a sense where if you're not, like, obviously, like, I don't want to say a name that's, like, kind of like, I don't know. If you're not getting, like, an all-star type of player, like, I don't see getting two role players how that's really going to do anything for you. The team is clear. It's Ant's team. It's Cat's team moving forward. This is Chris Finch's first year in the playoffs. He's made mistakes. D'Lo, this is only his second time in the playoffs. He's still young in that regard. This is only Cat's second time. So this, there's still a young team in that regard of making the playoffs. So I think he should stay, give it a whole nother run. And, you know, I'm comfortable with the team they have right now. You know, they could obviously – get a few more guys on the bench. But I think overall this team should bring back the guys they have, keep building that culture, and just make it consistent and then worry about the rest later. Minnesota's at an inflection point. They have not been good for a very long time. They made the playoffs in 2019. Very forgettable series. Now they're at the stage where we're relevant, we're a lot of fun, we're in the playoffs. Awesome. That's step one. Step two is how do you take it to the next level? That's what so many teams struggle with. The Jazz, they've been so much fun the regular season, really competitive, pretty good team. But, I mean, you become disappointing after two or three years, even, in this case, disappointing playoff exit because they literally could have been a number two seed and they choked several games they absolutely should have won. And holistically, it was not just D'Angelo Russell. Carl Anthony Towns, I was talking before, can you build Donovan Mitchell or an elite defense around him? Can you build an elite defense around Carl Anthony Towns as your center? I highly, highly doubt that because whatever you do with them, no matter what Chris Finch tried, was not going to fully work. And against the, the the Grizzlies, he was, in many cases, just absolute barbecue chicken. And then, of course, the the icing on the cake was D'Lo just offensively not being that guy. He wasn't the, the reliable guard you can go to late in games. There was, I don't know what game it was that they lost, but... Late, he had Desmond Bain on him, I and he took he the controlled, uh, not was, even a controlled fadeaway. It was it the was turnaround bad. Kobe shot, bad. and I wanted this, you know. <sighs> that was bad. <laughs> I never want to see him take that shot again. Um, and he's so limited. Like, is D'Angelo Russell a top 20 point guard? What? Is he? Top 20? There's a lot of good point guards. In the yeah, I, I think he's top 20. Guard. I thought you were, we're going to say a number to, like top, t- maybe 20 right now. We do that. We Let do me that pull up the, the NBA standing. So twenty I can, right now because that was insane. There's a lot of good point guards today. Okay, so Kyle Lowry, the here number one seed. Kyle Lowry or D'Angelo Russell? I right want to gauge. I want to gauge this. D'Angelo this, Russell. Okay. Okay. You know. <laughs> Drew Holiday. Drew Holiday. James Harden. James Harden. Fred Van Vliet. Fred. Okay, so rest S3. three. Steph. Kyrie Irving. Are we counting Kyrie as point guard? Yes. Okay. Kyrie Steph. You can take Steph. That's Kyrie. Five. Or sorry, not Kyrie, Trey. Yes. Ja, yes. Darius Garland. Yes. So Ja, that would make that seven. That's, eight, right? that's eight. That's eight. That's eight. Okay. Right. Lamelo, yes, nine. So we're at nine. The John three. Ten. Tyrese. CP Tyrese. 11. What's that set up? We're at nine. Tyrese Halliburton. Yes. Okay, we're going east Wait, and no, then No, Tyrese west. is the two. He's a point guard. Okay, whatever. So we're at nine. Um, Cole Anthony is an interesting one. No, um, it's not an interesting <laughs> one. Interesting. CP. CP. Easy answer. John Morant, you guys included. Correct 10. Yes. Okay. And did we include Steph? Yes. We did? Yes. Okay. Luca. Yes. Donovan Mitchell's technically a point guard. No, he's not. He's a now two. Now you're cheating. He plays point guard. No, he, no he's Conley a two plays guard. guard. Don't so cheat. So. Okay. Jamal Murray. Jamal. Okay. We're at 14. We're at 14. DeJounte Murray. Okay. Russell Westbrook. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. De'Aaron no. Fox. De'Aaron Fox. Next. How do you no, know that's just, actually close. That's, ah, okay, it's, it's not debate, as simple as you think. Big call. Damian Lillard. Dave. Anthony Simmons. D'Lo. D'Lo. Josh Giddy. <laughs> D'Lo. D'Lo. I don't. Don't add rookies. Don't add rookies to the list. So we can't include Cade. All right, add rookies to the list. I mean, he can add. They're just, they're not. He's, they're not better than him. Yeah. So. Kade, uh, Kade next year will be better. Easily. I know, but Kade, is he a and one, is he a two? What are we counting Kade as? Point guard. You want to count him as point and guard? And what number are we at? Can I kind of stop the 16? Well, we didn't include Kade. 
Um, if we're including Dame, him. would make seven. And we didn't. We did not include Dejounte in that sixteen. So that's eighteen. Okay. And then I didn't mention SGA. Your man. Nineteen. <laughs> and then Kevin Porter Jr. is the last one. No. What the hell? <laughs> yeah, D'Lo is better. So it's debatable with the Fox. Fox. So is- basically. Damn. 18th or 19th best starting point guard in the game. That's fair. Are you really getting that excited over it? Because he's 25. He's not very young anymore. He's been in the league for seven years. Bro, eight he's 25. Years. That's very young. Well, yeah, but I mean, he's been in the league seven or eight mean. years. Seven or eight years in the league is a long time. It is. Yeah, but he's like not. The prime is 27 and 32. But I think he'll be. He's been in the league since he's 19. Yeah, he'll be. Yeah, but he's. He's a player that's going to average consistently 20 to 22 and 20 to 22 points per game and seven assists. He'll probably be an 18, 19 guy from now on. I don't know. It he depends can't on score the situation. Well, inside the probably. It depends on it depends on the situation. I mean, what's your point here? Yeah, meanie. This is like the most volatile backcourt in basketball. And if you're trying to build a contender, if you're Minnesota, number one, they don't know who their uh, their GM is going to be next year. Right, right now, it's Sasha and Gupta. Um, maybe. They have him long term. I have no idea. But ultimately, if you're trying to contend, you can't right now with D'Angelo Russell and Anthony Edwards. And then that's just on top of the fact Carl Anthony Towns is your center defensively, and as special a talent as he is on the offensive end, there are moments in the series where he just wasn't good enough, and defensively, he's just not that guy. Wow. I mean,. I don't care about the D'Lo slander. I think he deserves it after how he played. Carl Anthony Towns, though, that's a cheap shot. Carl Anthony Towns was amazing outside of game one. He came to play. Minnesota's problem, in my opinion, he did come to play. Did amazing. you? Amazing. He was. Check the numbers. Don't just it's much deeper check, than the check numbers. Check numbers. Don't Late be a game, numbers wanna, guy. This is what I'm going to say. Defensively, I don't think that's what lost. Minnesota the series. I think what lost them the series is that they choke three times. Their shot selection in the fourth quarter, which it has been like this all year, is sporadic. They don't have a true point guard that can slow the game down and get players into their spots. Their offense was sporadic. Turnovers, bad shot selection. They let Memphis crawl back in the game that way. I understand that the defense, there's a lot left to be desired. You look at Anthony Edwards at the end of game five or game four, I believe. He gambles on the steal. Like, I understand that stuff. Carl Anthony Towns is good enough to where you can make a deep playoff run with him if he's your second best player, which is what's going to happen. The problem with Utah is that they were relying on Donovan Mitchell to be their guy. Where, at best, he's a top 15 guy in the league, which is good, but he's probably, like, at the 15 area. Anthony Edwards is going to be a superstar. Like, he's going to be top eight player in the league good. He's going to be an all-NBA defender. Wait, wait, he's wait, going wait, to be wait, an all-star wait, 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 starter. Wait wait wait. What was, what's, wait, wait, wait. What do you mean? What do you? I don't like that. I don't like that. Hold on. What do, you, <laughs> what do you mean the difference with Utah is they're relying on Donovan as opposed to Minnesota? Edwards is going to be way better than Donovan. He just choked three times in Edwards a series. Didn't choke. How he, old is Anthony Edwards? Edwards. He's 21. 20 years old. Something like that. And Donovan He averaged 25, 25 yeah. in his first playoffs. But I, but Don, do you remember Donovan's first playoffs? He was Don, 22. Hold, hold on. And Anthony Edwards is 20, not 21. Like No, he, no, he's 20. Yeah. That's yeah. What I, I just didn't like that shot you took as no, if I'm saying they didn't Don, choke three times. Anthony Edwards is going to be a better player than Donovan Mitchell. Okay. Anthony Edwards is going to be the best two guard in the league eventually. That's how good he's going to I just be. Didn't, the, the shot was very off because they choked three times. So, yeah, it wasn't all on Edwards. Donovan I understand has some, of the some experience on. doing that as well. Anthony Edwards is developing a ton. Defensively, year one, not great. You're seeing the progression with him on the end. You're seeing the growth he's going in his to vision. Be great Once he gets that mid-range shot, easily can be top five if he can develop the mid-range too because then he's got the most smooth package getting to the rim, the burst, the athleticism. The three-point shot won't be so important to his game if he's got the mid-range too easily going to be a top five player but the reason why i didn't really talk about that he's 20 we're probably like two or three years away from that and at that okay. point cat's going to be 28 i love d yeah and it was that's still prime age but i love d and i i wish i could say that i feel differently and i wish i could say that i wish they would keep d but it just doesn't feel like this is the best fit all around with his skill set, with Edwards and Cat, Edwards talked about it how they all want the ball in end of late late game situations. They all want the ball, and that gets hectic sometimes. I think next year's a year 
where Cat starts to notice Edwards is the guy. He lets him get fully get the keys. Cat, listen, I feel like he's gotten a lot of backlash. His first playoffs versus the Rockets, he didn't play well. Mm-hmm. In the playing game, he played bad. Yep. He made up for it, though. Game one versus Memphis, he played bad. He made up for it. Cat, I think, is solid enough to be your second option, and you can make a deep playoff run. And then I look at the talent they have. Jaden McDaniels is going to train with Kawhi Leonard this offseason. He's already said that. Jaden McDaniels is a guy who's <laughs> developing his offensive repertoire, and don't be surprised if he is in the running for most improved player next season. I think he can make it. He'll start next year? Yeah, I think he will start. This is what I, I have a trade, a D'Angelo Russell trade. I put it out on Twitter. My D'Angelo Russell trade is most teams, it's hard to find a trade partner because most teams, yeah. they just, they don't really want, they don't need a D'Lo. The Wizards, though, are the team that kind of sticks out to me because if they want to keep Bradley Beal, they have KP, them trading for KP tells me that they're trying to actually win now. Why don't you trade for D'Lo and get a big three of D'Lo, Beal, and KP? It's great because they have no, no ambition no, 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 so they no, no, can no, just no, be no, no, as no. mediocre what? as possible. <laughs> Joel. <Joel. laughs> you know what? Let's act like Washington has a brain here. They don't. I mean, they're, let's just, just for they a have second. the least ambition of any team. Let's just for a second act like they have a brain. Why on God's green earth would they want to... Play teams with D'Lo and Bradley Bill as a backcourt guarding other teams. Why? I'm not saying they want it, but I'm saying this is a trade package that can make sense. For who? It can make sense for both teams. Ah. I mean, D'Lo definitely gets there. They are a playoff team with D'Lo, Beal, and KP. They're not. Um. They, yes, they are. <laughs> not yes, in the East, are. bro. I don't nah, think they are. East. they are. They are. Look who was just a playing team. If they're healthy, they are. And Bradley Beal showed he can play defense. And D'Lo... D'Lo made leaps defensively this year. You're not that's not like he was a liability. He was you're, you're not with a, Pat Bev and Jared Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt. No, but no. And, and D, D'Lo was a main catalyst for the communication on defense, and he yeah, played yeah, well yeah, defensively. It's, it's, I'm, not, it's, I'm just it's, saying. He's a good communicator with good defenders but on the team. But can I finish my trade package? The trade package is D'Lo to Washington, and Minnesota in return gets Kuzma and KCP. I think for Minnesota, it makes a lot of sense. You now start Pat Bev, Edwards. I think McDaniel starts next season. You put Kuzma at the four, who has shown in his in the Lakers championship run, he can be a very good perimeter defender. Cat at the five. Then off the bench, you have KCP, Vando, Beasley, McLaughlin. This is a much improved team. I still would like them to get a point guard like Ricky Rubio to set the pace of the game up. I doubt they do. But I think if they want to get rid of D'Lo, this is best case scenario, and they're fitting players around Edwards. But if the offer isn't right, they have to run it back because I believe in this team figuring things out. This past season, they went through a lot of trials and tribulations, and sometimes you got to let teams figure it out. You got to let players figure it out. Edwards likes D'Lo. He likes Cat. Cat, D'Lo is his best friend. They all mesh well together. Sometimes you got to just let these things happen and let them figure it out. So I wouldn't be opposed to that either. Either. But if you can get players that fit around Edwards better, then I'm all for it. But this, you know, the Wolves are going to be fine. They're going to be fine. Anthony Edwards will make sure it's fine. Uh, first, I want to touch on, you said if the Wizards are healthy a few minutes ago, when you have Chris Tapps Perzinkas in your team, you're not allowed to say if and when they're healthy because, I mean, he, he's not going to. Um, but secondly, with D'Lo, I mean, you can't train him for nothing, obviously, because then you're taking a step back. And for Minnesota, like, at least making the playoffs for a second straight year is something. And if you trade him for nothing... Carl Anthony Towns is going to be like, WTF, you're going through one GM to another, and now you're not even keeping my guy, and the team just lost their starting point guard. And in the season, he was the one that calmly could get them into their sets. He was one of the best playmakers in the game, only averaging like seven assists, but he was that su- that su- smooth uh, presence for them, just running the offense in transition. Great passer with Anthony, Jaden McDaniels, Jared Vanderbilt, and just having that guard who can be the smooth hand, He's going to make good plays, can operate at the pick and roll, can hit shots, very volatile shot maker. And then defensively was showing some growth as a communicator and a leader in the locker room. You can't trade that for nothing, obviously. But if you can get some good wins out of him and maybe a guard that can replace him, that's a good enough playmaker, then you definitely have to have him on the market. Wow, all this D'Lo praise, I, I almost forgot. You just said he wasn't top 20. 
because we're talking about the regular season versus the postseason. The regular season, he was very good. In the postseason, he was AFK. And the Timberwolves are trying to go somewhere in the postseason, but you don't want to take two steps back by trading him now not even a playoff team. In a Western Conference, that's going to be much better next year when you have New Orleans healthy, the Clippers healthy, the Lakers people will always mention, of course, because the Los Angeles Lakers, and then basically all the other teams like Denver coming back a little bit better at least. So As opposed to the East, where if you trade d he's talking about the Wizards are going to make the playoffs, the Nets will still be here, the D-Lo, Hawks. d KP, that can make the playoffs. The Hawks. Or, in, or Nets, you got Cleveland still going to be good. It's, you just told me the Knicks would be better. Come on, man. Come on. You don't think D'Lo, Beal, and KB can make the playoffs? No. No. <laughs> no. You, are in, you are insanely low on Bradley Beal. No. <laughs> I, I'm just not. <laughs> I'm, I'm insanely low on that big three. Like, I really am insanely low on that big three. I do. I don't, I don't think that big three is that good. I think it's better than you think. I what think if, it's at least a playoff team. What if Bradley... Be, no, he's going to stay. But, I mean, there is some likelihood maybe he decides to leave. He'll get his bag first, and then he would request a trade. But, I mean, yeah, um, we're good on that. They're not making the blast. Yeah. So, you guys are all on the board of trading D-Lo? Uh, no, I said keep him. You want to keep him? Just for a year. Another one. If the market's not there after having an awful postseason, which is very likely, then I you're going to have to keep him for a I second said, straight year. You got to let him run it back. One more time. You got to see if it's real. You know, you can't just be a, you know, like you guys, a fluke. You got to see if it's real. Run it back one more time. So let's let's that Minnesota culture build it up. He helps you projecting them. there. What you're projecting about what you know because yeah. you talked about the Knicks being a fluke. Are you kind of talking about the Bulls in a sense? Because that's what's going to happen to you guys next season. Well, we're not a fluke because we're bringing the same guys back. We're a fluke mm. because we'll lose a guy. You guys brought everybody back. You actually got better and still sucked. So it was kind of different. So. I don't know. Reggie Bullock was a huge loss. I told you that. And you told me Fournier was better. <laughs> no. Yeah. Reggie Bullock is the man. It was out. You know? He's the man. Yeah, I told you that. He's the man. It's right. You know, I was listening to Draymond Green's podcast, and he talked about how Reggie Bullock, he was like, Reggie Bullock is a really good wing defender. He is. He was like, he and, was giving him a lot of praise. You guys let him walk. It yeah. seemed like the Lakers could have really used him this last year. I'm tired of talking about the Lakers. Yeah. He got 10 mil a year. Dallas and doubt for Dallas. Yeah. Well, I say that because he was on the Lakers and they uh, let him walk. Before we go on to the next uh, segment, a quick word from DraftKings. The NBA playoff action is nonstop at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. This week, new customers can bet just five dollars on any team to win and get one hundred and fifty dollars in free bets if they do. Looking to turn a small bet into a big payday during the NBA playoffs with DraftKings same game parlays, you can do just that. Create your own parlay by combining multiple bets like which team will win, total threes made, total rebounds, and more. And boom, you have a shot at an even bigger payout. Right now, all customers can place the same game parlay with three or more legs and get a free bet back up to $25 if one leg doesn't hit. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code TBPN. Bet $5 on any NBA team to win their game and get $150 in free bets if they do. That's promo code TBPN only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Now, this week in the NBA, Riff, what do you have? I'm glad I brought it up because I was going to not remember. Luka Doncic's most points in NBA history over a player's first two playoff games and first postseason triple-double in Dallas franchise history, putting up 31, 10, and 9 when I round it because I hate doing the little point points. Hate it. Luka has been amazing. You know, Luka has tried to put the team on his back. You know, he's tried to definitely will them. And people thought this would be a more competitive series in the first two games. Well, not me, but, you know, other people. They thought this would be a more competitive series because, you know, Dallas beating Utah, people, I guess, kind of overrated them a little bit because they played better without um, – I mean, pardon me, they played – great without Luka and they looked impressive Jalen Brunson looked like a star but they've kind of been hit with a little bit of a jam right now two get down two games to back to Dallas but shout out to Luka though that's an impressive feat today is Chris Paul's 37th birthday is it right? when he was a rookie the Kings were a playoff team that's not crazy and uh, speaking of the Kings they dropped their like top three head coaching candidates uh, for their new vacancy their newest um, of the many and it was Mark Jackson Steve Clifford and Mike Brown What's your guys' top three in that order? Mike Brown, Mark, Mark Jackson, Jackson, Steve Clifford. Mark like, Jackson is one. I like Mike. I think Mike Brown should be number one. Steve Clifford, I just 
don't think it's a good setup for him. In part Mike because Brown better not leave Golden State. Yeah, like why would you want to leave the Warriors to go to the Kings? Like, stability. why do you think Mike Brown is over Mark Jackson? <sighs> okay, so Mark Mark Jackson has three years of coaching experience, and he hasn't coached since LeBron was in Miami. It's been a very long time, and he's been around the game. Uh, it's kind of like John Gruden, where he's been away from coaching, and he's been in the booth, and he's got a great job there. I get he wouldn't want to be an assistant coach. But he hasn't gotten any reps to improve as a coach. And more importantly, he may be a good coach, but if you're the Canes, what are you trying to do? End this playoff drought or find stability and structure as a, as a franchise? Which one? Or both? Both. Okay. Combination of both. But what's more important? Structure and stability, long term? Structure and stability. By hiring Mark Jackson, who many people in management just absolutely hated, was hard to get along with. The Splash Brothers may like him, and so does they loved him. He inspired hope and belief into a franchise that, like the Canes, made the playoffs one time in like 17, 18 years. Things were horrible in Golden State, and he was the one that got the tide turning. But if really Canes, you've went through George Carl, Hall of Fame head coach, Dave Yeager, really good coach, did a great job there, pretty good job in Memphis, and Michael Malone. Malone, they just inexplicably fired. Carl, their franchise player, absolutely hated. He hated him. And Yeager management hated, or he, let me repeat, management he was trying to overtake because Vladi Divac should have never been NBA GM in the first place, and he was thinking I could kind of eventually become the GM, so on and so forth. Maybe like Brad Stevens in Boston. Right. And um, ultimately, he was fired because of that lack of stability. So the name, it sounds great. George Carl sounded great too, but you're trying to find stability, somebody that can kind of change the culture and the narrative. Chris Finch. Chris Finch was a guy they are pretty high on. The difference is Mark Jackson, he could be a really good coach. But he why proven it, he is? Joel, it's been a very long time since he was a head coach. Very what about long Mike time. Brown? It's been since two thousand nine. But he's been a Mike defensive Brown, coach for Mike, the past five six years. Though a lot of but he's had head coach. True. A lot of coaching. number one seed though, baby. But LeBron. All right. Well, Ty Lue was getting the same flack. And I he, know, but like, come on, yeah. that was a trash Cavs roster. Hey man, they were defensively great. Mike Brown's a great defensive coach. So much of coaching is player relationships and. When you look at Mike Brown, he's been to so many different places, Cleveland, L.A., Golden State. He's had different positions in different eras of the Warriors. You have the 2019 team that went to the finals. 2020, they're awful. 2021, they're kind of in between. They're trending toward contention, which they're in right now. He's seen so many different walks of NBA basketball. Mark Jackson is not in an NBA. Like, 2014 was the last time he was in a locker room. That's a real. That's almost a decade. You realize that, right? And now you expect him to change in his 50s, right? He's in his 50s entirely for a place that has no structure, no stability. Total group of new guys, too. A total enigmatic head coaching option that ownership, Kane's ownership, likes a lot. Vivi Ronadiev, Vivek, excuse me, may be the worst owner in basketball that basically he did hire Michael Malone, but for the most part, every single basketball decision these last 12, six months has been like the DeMontis Sabonis trade you guys didn't like. Why do you think Monty McNair made that trade? Probably because he was pressured by ownership to end a playoff drought. So he traded the one pick the team's hit on in the last three or four years to get DeMontis Sabonis, who may leave because, I mean, in two years he's a free agent. That's not the point. Mark Jackson is most definitely not the safe bet for the Canes. Mike Brown would be a better option. But if you're trying to avoid a 20 year playoff drought where maybe the team ends up having to relocate at some point, and also just being the worst franchise in all of pro sports, maybe Mark Jackson wouldn't be the best option to change the entire locker room and bring structure and stability because of his personality, the reputation. Um, you know, you seen some of the comments from Joe Lacob. So what you're saying, what you're saying is that Mark Jackson wouldn't be the better option to bring long term stability, but he'd probably be the better option to get into the playoffs right away. Did I mention the playoffs one time, Mark Jackson? I don't think you did. I don't know. I don't know where you got that from. No, yeah, you did. You said that Mark Jackson, you probably get into the playoffs. That's what I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure this out. You're so critical of Mark Jackson. What has Mike Brown done to have, to, to be a better candidate than Mark Jackson? He's won 66 games, went to the NBA Finals, spent um, the last eight years, unlike Mark Jackson in the NBA locker room. He's been to many different, uh, types of franchises, which Mark Jackson has not. He's been in a booth. Look, he knows. So basketball. Mark Mark Jackson hasn't been around NBA franchises, but in he, a locker he, room, he did play in the NBA. So it's not like he he's not unfamiliar with the locker room. He's top five in assists all time. That's that's street truck. 
really what do you mean cool. it's sweet? I mean, he's when was, he's been in the he's been in locker. You act like he's a stranger to locker rooms. Like 2014, the NBA was totally different. Totally different. Okay, you don't wait. Who's the person that that sparked the Warriors into changing the era of basketball we are now in? Didn't they win 17, 16 more games the year after he left because? The ISO offense that was basically what he was running turned into the motion offense with Steve Kerr and everything changed. And all of a sudden, they were a championship team after yeah, but the first round you, exit. But also, Mark Jackson was a start of that. Like, Mark Jackson was the one that said, these two are the greatest shooting backcourt in NBA history. And at the time, it was a hot take. So I don't like how you're discrediting Mark Jackson. I like Mike Brown. I think he can be a good head coach. But to act like, oh, Mike Brown is <laughs> this the guy's the better candidate. I mean, Mike Brown hasn't been a head coach since he coached LeBron, and they were winning 60-plus games, mostly on the back of LeBron. I mean, that was prime Le- That was like 23, 24-year-old LeBron. Well, he's been a head coach with the Lakers for two years or a year and a half. And what also happened there? The Cavaliers. What happened there? Well, he was fired after <laughs> like six or five games in 2013, 2014, wherever the year was. And then he was with the Cavaliers the year before LeBron came. Okay. but The, the point- year before LeBron came. And what was the record? Yeah. 34 and like 48. Okay. But the thing with Mark Jackson, I'm not taking away credit for the Splash Brothers and him, again, like inspiring trust and belief in the locker room uh, with the Splash Brothers. And Draymond Green will talk very highly of him. I get that. He was great for the Warriors. And again, he was the guy that helped turn the tide. But it's been so long. Like, why do you think only the Kings out of all the NBA teams have heavily considered him through the years? Just the Kings. In a time where they're on the, the brink of total disaster, Let's go with the guy that no one else will hire. No one else will. We will, though. We will. Because there's a reason why, you know, we haven't made the playoffs in over 15 years. You know, I don't fun. think Mark Jackson hasn't gotten hired because he can't coach basketball. I think Mark Jackson, Mark Jackson has got hired because of the political reason as to why he got fired in Golden State. I mean, he got fired because Golden State. The reason why Mark Jackson is not like within the Warriors organization is because I believe the owner's son is homosexual and Mark Jackson is a Christian and you can obviously understand where the divide in there lies and Mark Jackson is a very outspoken person about his religion. So that's what sparked the divide between Mark Jackson and the Warriors front office. It wasn't that Mark Jackson was an asshole or piece of shit person. It and or that he couldn't coach basketball. Mark Jackson can coach basketball. He's not this stranger to the basketball environment. He was a player. So he's been in locker rooms in both uh, as a player and as a coach. I'm just understanding if you're, if, if the Kings don't get Mark Jackson, I wouldn't look at a Mike Brown move and say, yeah, that was an A plus move. The guy only has three years of coaching experience total. No years in an assistant, just three years total. And again, it's been almost a decade since and the last And succeeded though. I mean, he succeeded. What happened, though, once he was no longer the coach of that They got team? better. That yes. doesn't mean what he did wasn't a success. He succeeded. But you see where I'm going with that, right? No, but just because naturally, Steph and Clay, along, they were going to get better. Like, they were just reaching what they could have became. That was just the beginning of what they did. They were going to get better naturally. I don't really care about the Splash Brothers right now. I care about Mark Jackson. Has no, he I gotten know. better as a coach since then? Or maybe as he lost a little bit of his fastball potentially because he hasn't coached in a very long time. I mean, that's an assumption. But what I'm saying is that in terms of his, question. In his tenure with Golden State, he succeeded. I agree. Just because they were better when he left because they implemented a new offense doesn't mean that he succeeded with that team. With that group of guys, He got he got success with them. Whether or not he's a better coach now versus then, I'm not sure. We don't know what he's doing on his off time. We don't know what he's doing in terms of trying to get better as a coach. I mean, but what about of- all the other guys? What about so many of the other candidates? Like, like who? Kenny, At- like they love to try to be the Warriors. Kenny Atkinson's probably not even interested in being the Kings coach because why would he leave Golden State to go to Sacramento, where it's not exactly the most stable franchise, <laughs> uh, say the least. But there's so many different assistants around the league that you would think would be potentially better options because they have way more coaching experience as assistants and they've been to different walks of NBA teams. Like if you're trying to get along for your players, it's good if you've been to different places. You look at Mike Brown, he's been to three different stops in the NBA, maybe a few more um, as a, like a lower end assistant. And then with uh, Steve Clifford, he spent a lot of time with Van Gundy's. He at least has been coaching for like over 25 years. Those guys have the experience and players only say good things about them. So, like, you may not be in the locker room yourself, but you know this guy's well-liked. The thing with Joe Lacob, 
you were saying that it's hard to have a coach when over 200 people or 200 people in your organization don't like him. Warriors management or ownership try to alienate him. But at the same time, so many of the reports with him were really bad looks. Like him trying to like say different lies to players and stuff like that. And then management's not on the same page. They don't like him. Ownership also doesn't like him. Like if there's all of this smoke, I mean, there's got to be some level of a fire here. And I understand what you're saying, but like you didn't talk about the assistants at first. It was Mike Brown versus Mark Jackson. I don't know what Mike Brown has done to deserve a head coaching job over Mark Jackson at this point in time. Just because he's an assistant doesn't mean that he would make a better coach than Mark Jackson. And with all those reports, sure, may, they may be true, they may be not. All I know is that Draymond Green, not too long ago, on his podcast, went on it and said, the fact that Mark Jackson is not a head coach is utter bullshit. That's a guy that was his player. Steph said the same thing. He co-signed that statement. I'm just saying, just because I'm I'm not saying just because they co-signed it, it makes it true, but that's a pretty big co-sign. Two of the biggest players, two of the most marketable and biggest players in the NBA saying this guy should be a head coach. They know basketball. If they feel like Mark Jackson should be a head coach, I'm gonna I'm gonna side with that statement. They certainly do, and Draymond knows more than us. But you can say the same thing with so many coaches around the league. Like Steve Clifford asked JJ Redick. So many people love Steve Clifford. So know, many people love like, Mike I'm Brown. Not, I'm not discrediting any of these coaches. I wouldn't be against any of these coaches getting the job, but you were clearly against Mark Jackson getting a job. Yes, because again, <laughs> is this the right decision for the Canes if they're trying to avoid total disaster and they're trying to build structure and stability without all of the clouds of doubt that may come with hiring Mark Jackson? Because again, what? in Sacramento, he's not going to have a young Steph Curry and a young Clay Thompson either. Every... Any move the Kings make is a cloud of doubt. Hiring Steve Clifford is a cloud of doubt. Why are you going to hire somebody who hasn't made it out the first round of the playoffs? I mean, he's had some pretty strong series against an Eric Spolster who's a great coach. No, I understand, but why are you going to why are you going to hire that type of coach? Why are you going to hire Mike Brown, who his last time I was the NBA coach with the Lakers didn't have success, and then when he was successful, it was LeBron. So every single coach they hire is going to come with cloud of doubt. What if they don't hire any of these big name guys like a Kenny Atkinson, Mark Jackson, Mike Brown, or a um, Steve Clifford? What if they hire an assistant coach? A Will Hardy. Is, or... is that not going to bring a lot of cloud of doubt? Oh, why did they go with an unproven guy who's never been a head coach? There was cloud of doubt when Minnesota made that Chris Finch hire. So the, the cloud of doubt reasoning, I'm not on board with it, but I'll let it slide. My this week in the NBA Frank Vogel, there was a report that came out that his in a, his handling of Russell Westbrook and the inability to make him a more productive part of the team played a big role in his firing. That's hilarious. <clears throat> Which means that the Lakers might potentially run it back with Russell Westbrook next season based on this report. <laughs> oh, shit. Sorry. It's just, damn, really? Yeah. There's a chance it happens if they're blaming Vogel this much. They must not want to win. Uh, all right, whatever. I also have a couple this week in the NBA. Of course you do. Kevin Love's message on Instagram. His heartfelt message. Led the league in double-doubles for a bench player. Broke a franchise record for three-pointers made off the bench. Tied in charges taken across the league. Led team in games played and played every game that wasn't due to him missing it because of COVID. He just feels <laughs> proud of himself that he's earned the respect back in the league. It wasn't too long ago that Kevin Love was, was viewed as the worst contract in the NBA. And while it's still a bad contract, he's a productive player. And now he has shown teams this past season that he can be a valuable player on a playoff potential team. Which I think that was huge for his career. And I, you know, this was a great this was a great look for Kevin Love. Shout out to K. K Love. Yeah. He might go to Chicago next. Yes, getting paid. You need a backup big. No, he's getting paid thirty one million dollars. <laughs> and now this other one. We've been doing Would You Rathers on this show, and they've done fairly well. Because of that, I want to do another Would You Rather. But this time instead of doing players who are clearly about to be past their prime like Westbrook and Harden. We're going to do somebody who's in it. Devin Booker. 
This is rapid fire, John. Rapid fire. Would you rather Devin Booker or this player? Zach Levine. Devin Booker. Devin Booker. Luka Doncic. Luka. Luka. Trey Young. Trey. Booker. John Morant. Booker. D Buck. Jimmy Butler. Booker. D Buck. Paul George. Paul George. PG. Jason Tatum. Tatum. JT. Okay. So that means you think D. Most of you guys said the right answer. So that means Devin Booker over. You said Trey. Mm-hmm. You said you said Trey. No, I said D. Book. You said D Book and you said Trey. Yeah. John Morant, y'all both said D Book. Yep. Jimmy Butler, you both said D Book. Easily. Paul George, you both said PG. Yeah. D Book is over PG. Jason, Why? huh? Why is he over PG? D Book <laughs> was just the best player on the team that went to the finals. This I don't season. care about teams. I, I'm <laughs> objectively, who is the better player? I'm not asking about the teams. They're close. Why D-book? is he better than? What is he better? Than PG at he's a better scorer. He's a better playmaker. He's not a better playmaker. He's a, he is a better playmaker. D book is a better playmaker than <sighs> Paul George. Why? How? Explain. He passes better. There's nothing to explain. He passes better. He's a better passer. I disagree. And D books progressed well as a passer and a distributor to his teammates, but PG's playmaking before was a CP bit above. before CP three got to Phoenix, D book was averaging six to seven assists per game. He was his like assists six, only went down because CP started taking control of the offense when he came there. But D book can easily average eight assists per game. PG, I don't know about he, PG can about too, though. Easily eight. Maybe. He can do it, but PG, we know he's even credited to Chauncey Billis for yeah. making yeah. him a better playmaker. Helped Kawhi Town. Yeah. yeah. But D book, I think he's Paul George defensively, he clears D book. There's something about D book's killer instinct. Ability to perform in big time games mm-hmm. that I prefer Devin Booker over Paul George. Better clutch understand. player. That's but if you want to put D- PG over D Book because of two way play, okay. Well, but close. Devin Booker this year just showed he he's been a great defender all season. Great's a strong word. Very strong. Top five in defensive rating they, for his position. I don't care about defensive rating. It's a unit. They Devin, they Devin Booker is not a slouch defender. They're he's close. a good defender. They're on the now. same level. So I don't I don't see. I don't see it's why you defender. guys are arguing about it. They're on the same level. <laughs> but D-Book is... Well, defensively, PG clears, and PG, I think, is a better shooter. He's a better three-point shooter. D-Book's better from mid-range. Yeah, PG's the better athlete. And transition, I think I'll give it to D-Book. D-Book's a very handles, good transition score. I might give it to PG. It's D- D-Book has better handles, bro. Nah, nah, D-Book PG has better is, handles than ah, PG. Nah, you're, I think you're... And D-book, D-Book's playmaking. offensive arsenal, mid-range is better. No, nah, they're around the I same. I think I, as a finisher, probably around the same. Yeah, off, like PG offensive arsenal, they're probably like better. around the same player. It's the defense that PG is clearly better. Well, we see D-Book just locked up Luka the other night. For one possession. <laughs> Have we seen that, though? Well, I mean, as a PG play- couldn't do that. No Luka comment. was cooking him. No comment. Luka was cooking him and Kawhi. PG was cooking Doug and Booker. You forget that? He, he was hunting if for they, Devin Booker. He was cooking again, him. If they face again, that's not going to happen. He was out, he was out there by himself. P, <laughs> he was Book. cooking both of them. You're not going to say that when D-Book wins a championship. You, got, you just got to watch a little bit more of PG, bro. He's a great playmaker. Just gotta watch a little I'm bit glad more. you're watching D-Book now. Yeah, man. They're around He's the same guy. going to win a championship. When finals MVP. That's something D-Book, I mean, that's something PG would never have on his resume. Okay. Finals MVP. He just made the playoffs at 26 years old. Second, second time. And he made the finals in his yeah. first appearance. Everybody got hurt. That's tough. That's I'm tough. sorry for interrupting you. I want to ask that question. D-Book question. First, D-Book first, Paul George. I prefer D-Book. Okay. Fair enough. I don't think, I, I think their handles are similar, but I think D-Book does have a bigger bag than him. Oh no! Now you're just now you're just now you're just trolling. He's quicker too no, with now, his handle. Now, is now he not quicker with his handle? Now you're just trolling. No, okay, I get it. If you think it's a better handles, but now you're a better bag. Now you're just trolling. Who, who's better posting up? PG. Nah, D book. His post game is different. So it's PG. You, you know what it is? It's it's because he's hurt. People forget. Somebody gets <laughs> no, hurt. No, it's not that he's hurt. He's not in the playoffs. So, that's it's not that he's hurt. He's just not in the playoffs. So what? What you mean? If you're referring to because you were referring to that. The reason I we're forgetting about him is because he's injured. He played forty games this year. Yeah, he was great in those forty games. He'll be back. It's not deep book good. He, he has a bigger bag than deep book. Come it's on, it's not deep book like, good. His hand was crazy for a six nine guy. 
So Ben Simmons, as of recently, he just got a back surgery. It's going to take three to four months to rehabilitate from. And he got surgery on it. And do you think that this means that people now owe him an apology? We had Reggie Miller tweet out that uh, he's soft and he's weak mentally because he didn't play in a, a game four closeout game that, you know, the Boston was up 3-0 on. And he called Ben Simmons soft for not at least giving it a go. Now, what do you think about this now that we know the injury was very real? He got surgery on it. Do you think now people owe Ben Simmons a little bit of an apology? Well, I think I don't think he was soft for not playing in that game for. I just didn't think it made sense for him to play in a game for. He hasn't played ball in a year. That's a high pressure situation. It just logically doesn't make sense. I also think Reggie Miller comes from a completely different era, which they played a completely different vibe. It's just the, the mentalities was different. They got to stop doing that. I get it. It's different mentalities. These guys are different nowadays. But I still don't think it really it really just for me, it depends. When did he get hurt? Like, that's the thing for me. When did Ben Simmons realize he had a back problem? Because if I remember correctly, he didn't want to play in Philly because he didn't want to play in Philly, not because he was hurt. That was the beginning of it. Then he started to say, oh, I have back injuries, stuff like that. So it's like, when did he get hurt? Because he didn't, he was scared, not scared, let me not say that. He just didn't want to play in Philly because he didn't want to be there. There was never a back injury to start the whole situation. So I can't really give, say people owe him an apology for that. Now, do people owe him an apology because he didn't play in game four? Yeah, because obviously the back injury was lingering in Brooklyn. He obviously had a back injury in Brooklyn. So I think people definitely deserve an apology for that situation. But as far as I'm concerned, the situation in Philadelphia, he was he was healthy. He was ready. He just didn't want to play. Maybe he not have been healthy, but that's not what he said at first. He just didn't want to play in Philly. So for that, I can't really give you an apology because you didn't want to play there after you fumbled the bag and you choked. But hopefully... You know, speedy recovery. Hopefully, gets better next year. He'll be back, but I don't think people deserve an apology for the Philly situation. Brooklyn, though, yeah, you got to give him his problem. You got to give him. You got to give him an apology because a back injury is serious. So that could, something that can really fatal your career. And he's still twenty six years old. So, yeah, it does seem a little bit weird. Like holistically, you look at it, it's like this dude hasn't played in over a year. How has he had back issues? But then you look at Michael Porter Jr. He was like in preseason looking super weird. It's like, oh, whatever. And then next thing you know, he's game back surgery like six weeks later. And especially for a young player, that stuff's scary. Like Michael Porter Jr. is about 23, 24, and Ben Simmons a year or two older. Like back issues are nothing to mess with. And that same logic could comply with Ben Simmons. And I'm not totally defending Ben, but like you have to look at it from the angle. Michael Porter Jr.'s back wasn't right after the offseason himself, too. And next thing you know, he's getting surgery. So, I mean, yeah, it's tough definitely deserves some level of an apology but i mean i feel like a lot of people get mad at him too it's just because like they, he hasn't spoken to hasn't the media, consistent hasn't spoken to the media and is making like 30 million dollars and fans they want to see the product now and if this dude's making more than Joel Embiid and he's not even out there you're left in the dust because he's not communicating anything with you that lack of communication is so frustrating especially if your team's not playing well so you can understand it from that angle as well but again you know back issues are so serious that you have to be forgiving to some extent. When he got first, when he first got traded to Brooklyn, I kind of thought he wasn't going to play. At first, I said that he's he's not going to play right off the bat because he did use mental health as a reason as to why he's not out there. And I thought it would have been a bad look had he played right away because you look at it, you're like, oh, you know, it kind of looks like a major lie. So I thought that was going to happen, but then. He went months, weeks without playing. And I was to the point where I don't think he was going to play again. I don't think he was going to play this year for the Nets. He wasn't going to see the court this year. After the Nets went down 0-3, I don't think anybody should have expected Ben Simmons to play. Even though he was eyeing game four as a return, we all thought the series would have been at least 2-1 at the point. It would have been tied up. It would have been a either t a tied up series or Nets up one or Celtics up one, whatever. That wasn't the case. We know what three O leads are in the NBA. It's you lost a series. The team is just better than you. Putting Ben Simmons out there in that type of game in a playoff environment, him not playing basketball in over a year, and the first the first action he was going to get in was a 
high intensity playoff t- playoff game versus a team in Boston, which is the best defensive team in basketball, just sounded like a recipe for disaster. It sounded like it sounded irresponsible. And whoever reported him that he was reported that he was about to play, I thought was irresponsible. I thought the backlash he received for not playing in that game was ill willed. You see Reggie Miller coming out with, oh, he's just a weak player mentally and all this other stuff. I thought that was a load of BS. I think we're in a new era with players that we recognize these serious problems. And with Ben Simmons, it's not only mental health, but it's also his back. I don't know when he got his back injury, but I did mention last pod that um, mental health does play a factor in back issues. That could have very well happened. We don't know. But this back surgery just stamps that he was hurt. And putting him out there for a game four would have been ridiculous. It wouldn't have made any sense, especially since his type of skill set wouldn't have helped the Nets much in that series regardless. So because of that, I thought it was irresponsible in how people covered this. And people do owe him an apology. But at the same time, there's an expectation that they say he should be ready before training camp. There's an expectation that, okay, this season was a wash, but next year you better come in ready to go. There's no, you can't miss the first game of the season. You have to come in ready to go. You have to be the best version of yourself. There's no more using these excuses because that then it just seems like he doesn't want to play basketball anymore. And we don't know where he's at with that, but I feel like this year is a year that I'm really going to use to judge Ben Simmons on his desire and how he feels about basketball because he's in a new situation. He's now going to be healthy. This is where I'm going to really judge Ben Simmons. But at everything else, I feel like the uh, the backlash from not playing was a bit absurd, in my opinion. It was a bit absurd. Yeah. It's it's really a tough situation, especially I understand Brooklyn fans. You know, like you said, they want to see the finished product. They want their guy to play. You know, this is somebody they down 3-0. They were panicking. They were getting destroyed. So it's it's understandable. Like you said, I, I don't want, like, next year is going to be a big year for him because this is going to be the year where it's like, bro, you're 25, 26 years old. People still believe you have this unworldly potential that has yet to be tapped. People still believe you can be this guy, and now you're in a situation where you have to fill some shoes. You know, Kevin Durant, Kyrie, you're the third guy, so it's it's going to be tough next year. And Brooklyn has a lot of holes they have to fill, but if he does get healthy, you know, hopefully, like you said, he plays game one. He needs to be there preseason start, regular season start. There should be no, oh, I got to rest this, rest that. You've had a year to rest. You've got your back fixed. There should be no excuses for next year. Yeah, I agree. On to playoff talk which is the trending topic right now, a bunch of playoff talk, which is the best time of the year. The Suns are up 2-0 against the Dallas Mavericks. First game, they were blowing them out, and then Luka and them crew come back. Game two, they got blown out the water in the second half of the game. Now, we've seen Luka dominate the ball this series a lot. Every series. Yes, you're right. He's averaging 40, though, 48-8. His splits are amazing, 54% from the field, 43% from three. But do you think Luka's ball dominance is a problem? I know in the Discord you got into an argument with Epic about this and about how if he could change his play style. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We were, um, let me think, let me think. My memory really is terrible. We were talking about if Luka, if you swap Luka and Devin Booker right now, will the Suns be as good? And I said, no, not right now. Like, it takes time for somebody to learn how to play off ball and stuff like that. Um, but in Suns ter- would be better. Hmm? Suns would be better. Better than who? Luca on the Suns is better than D Book on the Suns. I don't know. What's the topic for another day, though? I don't think. I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't. I don't. Th- I don't see a much bigger difference. I, I do. You think so? Yep. It's Luca. What do you mean? Luka's a better player than D-Book. Just because you're a better player doesn't mean the situation deems it better. If you are if you are going off the assumption that Luka, and Luka dominates the ball in Phoenix as well, which is a possibility, that would look a lot like Harden in Houston with CP, which that team almost beat the best team ever assembled in basketball. 
Mm, I don't. This, that's tough. This and Luke is a better playoff performer too than Harden. I don't think so. I don't think it will look the same. But that's neither here nor there. Let's talk about the series. You know what I'm saying? Let's talk about let's talk about the the back and forth. It's not even been a back and forth. Um, Luca being bald. It, it's like it's like you said, bringing up James Harden. People compare them because they they're the same type of player in terms of ball dominance. It's kind of like heliocentric offense. He has the ball a lot. Jalen Brunson, you saw when he Luca was out, he break out. I don't. We don't. We're, it's, everybody's still trying to figure out is that more bad Utah defense. Or just Jalen Brunson breaking out. We don't know. We'll give it a 50-50. Jalen Brunson was great, but Utah's defense is also bad. The Suns are a different beast in Utah, clearly. They just have focused on stopping everybody else and kind of letting Luka cook. And even in if you watch the games, Luka's been cooking, but it's like 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 the game one, Luka was cooking. But he was kind of cooking in the sense where he kept trying to just keep them in the game. Like the Suns look like they've had control from the start to finish like there's, they've been not in cruise control but they've kind of been on we know what they're going to bring to the table but they're just not as good as us they've been in control from offense and defense and then last game you saw in the second half they just took over I think the role players haven't been good in terms of offense they haven't been as best as they they could have been in terms of the Utah series because Utah isn't the same as the Suns the Suns know how to turn it up in the playoffs we've seen that and Utah like you said on the perimeter they're just not as good as Phoenix, you know, you got guys like Bridges. Devin Booker puts that effort on defense. Chris Paul at this age still puts that effort on defense. Jay Crowder, Cam Johnson, even DeAndre Ayton, he he gives that effort on the perimeter when he gets on the switch. So you got guys who play for each other, give that effort on the defensive end as in terms of Utah where they're just letting you cook up. It's really tough for Dallas. They're looking at different – they're looking at this defense, and it's really tough for them to score. They're just not that type of players. And Luka – he needed Jalen Brunson to be that guy he was in round one to make this series competitive. As great as Luka is, Phoenix is a – there aren't the Clippers where Phoenix is kind of more well-rounded in the sense where they – like everybody chips in, everybody does their thing on offense, and they're just too much better than Dallas from 1 to 10. So it's it's really tough for Luka right now. But I think, you know, him averaging 40 is great. But I think that – like I don't think it's – that big in a landscape where he's going to do that regardless, but his teammates have to step up. So his numbers have to go down. Yes. Jalen Brunson and Spencer Dinwiddie, you know what they're shooting for this year's two games, but probably not good. 32%. And that's the second and third. And as good as those guys had been at stretchers this year, we saw Jalen just completely dismantle the jazz in the first few games of the first round. It's a learning curve because they didn't have to play a team like the Suns in round one. The Jazz were, like I've said before, they're very flawed in many different ways. Now they're playing a Suns team where they're trying to work together again. They're not playing with each other for several weeks. And ultimately, they're playing on the road against the best team in the Western Conference, perhaps, in my opinion, they are. And it takes a little bit of time for them to kind of get back into a rhythm against one of the best defenses in the game that matches up pretty darn well against them. Are the Suns going to sweep the Mavericks? I don't think so. They're just the better team. And Luka, as good as he's playing, his team is just outmatched. Maxi Kleber, he's shooting like 45%. Bro, they haven't beaten him in like two years. Uh, oh, yeah, the, the yeah, Mavericks. It's, yeah, it's been mad they long. They may have Luka. November 29, 2019. Oh, my God. Yeah, and I think the Suns would rather have DeAndre Ayton because now they have Monty Williams and Chris Paul. Um but yeah, I mean, the Suns are just a better team. And, like, I don't think it's <laughs> that confusing. Like, as good as Luka is, they're just outmatched. And this goes to show you need a number two that's a little bit more than Jalen Brunson, as good as he was at peaks during this year. Right now, he's not playing well enough. Jalen Brunson is a good player. He's not a great player. That's really what's showing in this series. The Suns are just a better team. Every single quarter, it seems like they've had control. The Mavericks just shoot the lights out the ball. Even though everybody talks about how this team is so outmatched, I think that's more due to Phoenix just pe- being that good than Dallas being bad. Dallas is still shooting 41% from three. I mean, they're still shooting well. I understand Brunson and Dinwiddie haven't been there, but I said this before the series started when we previewed it was that Luka replaces what Brunson did. He doesn't add on to it. So what Brunson was doing averaging 28 versus Utah, Luka comes in, the ball is now out of Brunson's hand. It's now in Luka's hand. 
The shots for Brunson are much different. It's much more spot-up stuff. Occasionally, he gets the ball. It's harder to find his rhythm like that. You don't want the ball in Brunson's hands that long anyway against a team like Phoenix, but that's why he hasn't had the same value in this series versus Utah. I underestimated how good the Suns were. And a common theme in these playoffs for me is overestimating star power and thinking that is enough to beat a well-rounded team. Celtics versus Nets. I picked the Nets because Katie and Kyrie, they'll save the day. Mavs versus Suns. Oh, I have the Mavs in seven because I think Luka is just that good. But the truth is, well-rounded, great, greatly built teams outweigh star power. Especially if that team, which is the Suns, they don't have the superstar, per se, like a top 3-5 player in the league, but they have an all-star in D-Book. They have an all-star in CP. And D-Book is teetering around that area of where he's a little bit more than an all-star now. He's becoming that now. So they have some stars, but it's just all around. They just have a great team. They have great role players that surround those guys. I think Luka's ball dominance is an issue, but I think it's an issue that they can't get around right now because the issue is that, yes, he's super ball dominant, but what's the alternative? You give it to Brunson, you give it to Dinwiddie, you run some type of motion offense. I mean, there's really no alternative here. He's ball dominant because he has to be ball dominant because the Dallas Mavericks to this point in his career have failed to sur- to pair him with a legitimate second star. Kristaps was supposed to be that. He flopped in Dallas. Injuries were a big part in that. And also, he just wasn't the player that everybody propped him up to be. Jalen Brunson just as recently started to become that second option, but we know he's not good enough to be a second option. Right now, Luka has to be ball dominant because of that. 37% usage percentage in a regular season. That's the most all-time. In the playoffs, it's even higher. It's at 40%. So in the playoffs, every single possession pretty much is ran through Luka. I also don't like their offense. Their offense is Luka brings it up. He takes a step back shot. Or Luka brings it up. He dribbles out the shot clock until there's seven, six seconds left. He passes it to a teammate. That teammate has three seconds to shoot or Lucas settles for a jump shot or it's a pick and roll. The offense is very is very bland and it's easy to defend. And we see the same thing in guys like James Harden in Houston. He wasn't able to win playing the way he played. Granted, they ran into Golden State, but they went when they ran into Golden State, they had he had somebody in CP who was able to take the load and also carry the offense. Luca doesn't have that. I think it's possible to win when somebody when it's when there's a heliocentric offense. You just have to have the personnel. The Mavericks don't have the personnel, and I think in this series that's just what's been showing the most. They just don't have the necessary players to get by that. Phoenix is just a great team. I think they're the best team in basketball. And my pick out the West is the Warriors still, but Phoenix is a better team. I'm picking the Warriors because of the staff factor, but the Suns, there's no weakness on their team. Wing defenders, they have it. Shot creators, they have it. Interior presence, they have it with DeAndre Ayan. Switchability, they have it. They, ha- they There's no weakness for Phoenix. The most clutch team since those Warriors teams with Steph in 2017-2016. The Mavericks just aren't dynamic enough. And the Suns, we left the prop up, Devin Booker, an MVP race, or this and that with player awards. They're just perfectly built and the cohesion of their unit gets the most out of their personnel. You look at the mid-range shooting. They're unlike any other team we've seen the last five years that's so dominant. They don't take a lot of threes. They don't get to the rim much. They don't get to the foul line a lot. They're just hyper-efficient at everything. Three-point range, they got a bunch of marksmen. Mid-range, best in the game. They get to the rim, they're efficient there. DeAndre Ayton, highest field goal percentage in playoff history. Small sample, I don't care. Pretty impressive. And then, of course... Defensively, they have the, the everyone's bought into the role, and Mikel Bridges is phenomenal, the best three and D win in basketball, and everybody else has fit in line with the culture cultivated, and it reminds me a ton of San Antonio, uh, those 2014 teams, so on and so forth. This is some of the best basketball we've seen, but since they don't have a Luka Doncic or this exciting Grade A or Tier A star, people don't fully appreciate it, but it's basketball at its finest. Yeah, I think Phoenix, you're right. 
and they're the best team in basketball to me. They just have no weakness. And what they've been able to do, I mean, I think the record is 71-0 after leading after three quarters. They don't blow leads. They're a disciplined team. And it's just versus the Mavericks. You see it. It's every single quarter. Even if the Mavericks go on a little bit of a hot streak from three and they're leading or whatever, the Suns have had complete control of this series. Maybe Luka gets them one. But even that, I'm like, this could be this could be a sweep. Just because the Suns have... I mean, before game two, I mean, I think it was the second quarter of game two, the Dallas Mavericks got their first lead in the series. To be fair, the Suns shot 65% from the field in game two, and they're going to be pretty efficient in the series. That's kind of just how the Suns team is built. Um, but they're not going to be this efficient. Like Chris Paul shooting 62%, that's going to go down the road a little bit. In my opinion, I, I think... Know, if he's hunting Luka, I don't know. 62%. That's that's almost two out of every three shots going in. I think Luka gets a game, maybe two. It reminds me a lot of the, the Denver-Golden State series, but that also speaks to the, the matchup for the Suns and just how special a team they are. All the attention's been on Golden State. They're a great team, um, but the Suns team is different. Yeah, I agree. And also, like, Luka being, heli- being ball dominant, it's a given, but defensively, he has been a net negative and. Luka is, in, is is creeping into that category of a player where everything he does is being excused. There's an excuse for it. Luka's a bad defender. It's as simple as that. Last year, he got hunted in the playoffs versus the Clippers in the fourth quarter. Now we're seeing the same thing happen. I mean, there are times where Jay Crowder is beating him off the dribble. I counted two times it happened in game two in the second half. Jay Crowder is beating him off the dribble. I understand if it's D-Book, if it's CP3, you can't let Jay Crowder beat you off the dribble. And although, and somebody on my comments when I when I made a video about it was saying that, oh, but the Mavericks rotations are messed up. Yeah, because if you let one player blow by you, the rotations get messed up because people have to help. Like it's just it's that's how it happens. Luca, even if the bucket hasn't been scored on him, the bucket happened as a result of his defense, and his defense has been horrible. Does he get some slack because he's carrying such a big offensive load? Yes. Does he get <laughs> ultimate like you're just going to it's avoided? Oh, you don't even pay attention to his defense because offensively, look, no. Defensively, he's been horrible. And I think that's a trend within these young stars at point guard. John Morant, Trey Young, Luka, they're all great offensive engines, but they're not good defenders in the least. They're below average defenders. Lucas passable off his size relative to John Trey, but yeah, you're right. Great offensive engines. Getting, getting burnt down by Jay Crowder is embarrassing. Like it's just not. Come on, like you should be at least be able to guard him. You know, Trey Young, he gets a little pass because he's small. He's like six feet tall. Luca, you're six seven, bro. It's not like you move like a pigeon. It's also, I don't think we realize how strong he is. Yeah, he's a his lower body. He's, he's a upper. strong. That's what I'm saying. So it's like, come on, you know, Jay he has Crowder, a six pack, right? See, and Jay Crowder? I don't know. Oh, right. I don't know if he has a six pack, but I wouldn't be shocked though. No, nah, he probably does. JJ like Redick on his podcast said that when Luca takes his shirt off, it's it's not what you think it is. Well, can't guard Jay Crowder. So you might think it's like gee, I don't know. Chubby. I think How do you think Luca looks with his shirt off? I know that's a that's like a, blobby. That's a crazy question. Not like so? not like six pack, but just kind of like, you know, not blobby, but like flat in a sense. Is there a picture of with his shirt off? I'm not Look at, please don't look that up. No, I'm looking at <laughs> basketball reference. He's listed at 230, and he weighs more than that. How do you know that? I just don't think he weighs 230. <laughs> That's probably his rookie, like, weight. No, man. he's, how do you know he's more than 230? I mean, wasn't he, like, 260 coming into the season? He could lose weight. He wasn't no damn 260. 260 is crazy. I thought it was 260, right? There are no pictures with his shirt off. Why would there be a picture with his shirt off? Yeah, TMZ, they might get it. He's at a beach. You know those pictures where oh, yeah. celebrities <laughs> just at a beach. Yeah, they be they be on some weird yeah, stuff. I wonder if Luca has a six pack though. I wonder if like you can see his abs like visibly if he's like that strong. I wonder how it looks. Probably not. Regardless, he's very strong. Yeah. Like Cam, uh, I'm, he was posting up Cam Johnson in the in the well, game Cam two. Is mad little. Cam Johnson is act stronger than you think though. Probably. 
He looks like my frame, just six nine. Uh, I and Luca was bullying yeah. him. <laughs> JJ talked about it how Cam Johnson was like out of breath by the time <laughs> that he backed him down in the post. A player that plays similar to Luca is James Harden, and the Sixers are down 2-0 in this series versus the Heat. Joel Embiid is playing for Game Three. We'll see if they make it two one. But the biggest storyline of this series has been, well, one, Miami has dominated it from top to bottom, but it's James Harden's lack of aggression. Since he got to Philly, he hasn't taken more than 23 or 25 shots in the game. Now, we know that James Harden is still recovering from a hamstring injury, but what do you believe? Do you think that James Harden is, do you have faith that he's going to return to his former self or at least a version of it? It might be over. Like this might be the end, of, the end, the end of James Harden. But if he had, if there was one time to bank in faith, I feel like if they, I think they're gonna lose in the second round. He'll have a long off season, so he'll have enough time to really fix whatever is still lingering from that hamstrings. You know, rest up, get healthy, and then next year, you know, will be the year where he's back and he had a full off season of really getting healthy. You know, so I think that that can definitely help him. So if you want to bank on Harden getting back to that next year, then, you know, bank on that. But I don't think he'll ever be the player he was. I think right now he needs to understand he needs to define his game. He needs to expand it, be a little bit different than what he used to be. He's not able to blow people by like he used like he, he's not able to blow by like he used to. But develop that jump shot. You know, you get a lot of open looks and Bede's going to get you some open looks. Start becoming, a, you know, being able to be a spot up shooter. Get that mid range back in your bag, you know, having that. But, like, it's it's still tough, you know, but I think he can still reinvent his game. I've seen guys do it. You know, Derrick Rose, he's not as great as Harden was, but you've seen Derrick Rose reinvent his game after multiple knee surgeries, which is tougher than I think what Harden's going through. So I think Harden, like I said, in the full off season, just getting healthy, I think he can reinvent his game, but I don't think we'll ever see Houston Harden ever again. Like, I think he's gone. How much longer does he get the hamstring excuse? Hamstrings are tough, man. I understand. And there's no, like, real timetable for it. That's the point. Like, hamstring things linger. Like, next season, are we still going to be giving him through next winter the hamstring excuse? Or are we just going to realize the dude's 32, he's played almost 1,000 games in his career, and when you have such a high usage, he was the Iron Man through, like, seven, eight years, nine in his career. But, I mean, at a certain point, his body's going to break down. He's not quite LeBron or CP going on this vegan diet, I would assume, right? Um, (laughs) So, I mean, right now, I don't... So I know I don't know how Joel Embiid's playing. That kind of surprises me, uh, but he is. Well, he's up by a little bit. But I mean, yeah, I mean, it, some of it's the hamstring, some of it's the age, the the wear and tear of his of his play style. And I mean, he's like a. I feel like D'Angelo Russell's like a B minus version of what James Harden is now, which is a great player, one of the best playmakers in the game, pretty good three point shooter, but he's just not the player he once was. Gain side, blowing by a defender, and gain to the line. I give it to this offseason. You asked for a timetable. I give it to this uh, until this offseason. Chris Paul injured his hamstring. 2018 Western Conference Finals. Game five, at the end of game five. He came into that 2019 season not the same player. The burst was lost. To the point that in the 2019 playoffs, when they faced the Warriors again, you notice that Chris, every, the headline was, is Chris Paul washed? He doesn't look like the same player. It's the hamstring. That offseason, he gets traded to OKC. He's able to do his normal routine of working out before the season. OKC makes the playoffs, gets traded to Phoenix. Now we see what Phoenix is doing. So he James Harden gets that timetable. Last season, he played through a grade two hamstring in the playoffs. Chris Paul didn't play through his hamstring injury. I guarantee that would have made it worse. Yeah. Harden played through his two games, 30, 35 plus minutes each of those games. This past offseason, his trainer even said that all he did was rehab his hamstring. He didn't do his normal offseason routine which makes sense as to why he wasn't fully ready for the season. So this off season where he's been fairly healthy for the year, he gets to, to do his normal off season routine off season workouts. So I'm expecting to see a similar version of Harden to what I've been seeing the all NBA Harden 
this upcoming season. This this these playoffs this past season, I'll give him a pass. But I expect him to have a similar revival to what CP had after that 2019 season. CP3 is older. He's not washed. How about the way a player takes care of his body and also the on-off switch that CP kind of has for the regular season? We were talking about it earlier, I think, the last time we were on. You're like, CP's not... You look at his stars, he's not a... You're basically saying he's not that all-star level player anymore, but he can flip that switch late in a game in the fourth quarter, completely takes over. We saw in moments against the Pelicans when Devin Booker went down still, he had some special plays. Does Harden quite have that? Number one, he hasn't taken care of his body the same way CP does. And he is younger, yes, but the way with CP, he has an on-off switch that it works well enough because he's got D-Book alongside him in Phoenix. But can James Harden have that same model of the on-off switch where he can still take over a game late? We haven't seen that. But well, we've never have. really seen it in his career. I mean, CP3 has always been one of the best fourth-quarter players in the NBA. What I'm saying with Harden is that even with his hamstring messed up, he's averaging 19 and 10, essentially, basically. This full offseason that he has to get his body right, yeah, he's not Houston Harden 35 and 7, 30 and 30 and 8, but can he be 24 and 8? There's no reason why he, sh- he, he shouldn't be 24 and 8 or 24 and 10. Like he should be 24 and 8 on good efficiency next year, and the burst should be there. To me, it's less about having that on and off switch and him having that same burst that he's had. In years past, I I don't think Harden takes care of his body as well as CP3 or LeBron, but he's taking care of his body well enough to before when he got to when he got to Brooklyn, despite all the overweight allegations, he played at an All NBA level in Brooklyn, 24 and 12, averaging he averaged that there, and they had the best record in the in the Eastern Conference when he did play. So I'm expecting that same version of Harden in Philly after this offseason, but. If we don't get it, it's disappointing because we're looking, we're watching the decline of James Harden in this series versus the Heat. Not counting Game Three, he's averaging eighteen, six, and seven, shooting thirty nine percent from the field and twenty five percent from three. He hasn't been the same player and has been this way all year. And this is probably this was his best shot, at least in recent memory, to win a championship outside of CP three and the Warriors and the Nets just were injured. But with Joel Embiid. This was the perfect opportunity, and he goes down. I'm giving Harden until this offseason to make my full decision on him. He's going to be 33 next year, and then he's getting that massive Supermax contract he's expectedly. Not, he's not going to get the Supermax, though. You sure? What makes you think that? Because he said it. He's not going to get it. I don't think Philly would give it to him regardless. He's going to opt in his $47 million. You get a pay cut? Um, I don't think so. I oh. think he's going to opt into his $47 million, but... For one, he can't get a super max because it's not the Rockets. It's not the same team. He can get a max, though. The Bird Reds, they transfer over via trade. Well, I don't think he's going to get a super max. And I think if Philly pays him that, they'd be ridiculous. Yeah. To pay Harden 50 plus mil or 50 mil a year. Plus, they got a lot of holes. They got to retool. Through, he's, through, through his like 36 years old is ridiculous. I don't think they do that. But he's going to opt into his contra- his $47 million option. Well, that would be till he's 38 years old, which would be a little bit worse. I don't know. That's a very scary thing for Philly because if they get that to him and he's 35 in the middle of that, he's only two years away from 35. It's kind of scary. And like we talked about with CP, like he's always had that on-off switch. James Harden has not. And I don't think the burst is just going to come back when he's a year and a half, two years older. I don't see it. And I think him working out the same way he did is going to help with the burst. Like that's going to help, you know, rehabbing and rehabbing and trying to walk on your leg versus doing explosive in-game workouts will, de- will definitely help, you know. During the season, they travel so much, they don't have enough time to do all that other stuff. So I think it'll help out a lot. I think we're going to see a similar version to Harden that we saw when he first got to Brooklyn next year. But I don't think it's... I haven't lost faith in Harden. I think he's going to be the same mm-hmm. player. Really? You haven't lost any faith? No, nope, I haven't. He, he dwindling though. He for this season, yes. I know what Harden is, but this is not faith. I just know what Harden is right now. But have I lost faith moving forward? No. Hope he's he, going to bounce back. Hope he bounce back for you, buddy. Yeah, yeah he's going to win a championship. <sighs> That's what's going to happen. Sheesh. He's going to be Steph in the when, finals. When did I tell you this? I told you just like what four years ago. I was like Harden and Westbrook could never win a championship. 
Yeah. Westbrook won't. Harden will. Hope so, buddy. No chip is crazy. Game three of the Warriors versus Grizzlies is happening Saturday. And Dylan Brooks got suspended in the beginning of game two. He only played three minutes in that game. Everybody made a big deal out of it because was it dirty? Was it not? Did he deserve the suspension? So I'm going to ask you two, one, did he deserve the suspension? And two, what do you see from the Warriors and Grizzlies moving forward and who wins and what you've been seeing from these two games? Um, yeah, I think he deserves the suspension, you know, because like if you watch the play a few times, I don't like I don't think he was ever going for the ball. You know, I, like you, you watch him. I really don't see him ever going for the ball. And even his lift off, you can tell he was nowhere near the ball. You know, so I think in a situation like that, he's already at the basket. We know GP. He's pretty athletic. He's a guy who, you know, has a lot of bounce to him. Dylan Brooks is that type of player. You know, I think even watching it from certain angles, you can see he was literally locked in on GP's body. He was never, his intent was never the, the ball. And even after the play, he didn't really check on GP too much. He, he just kind he just kind of looked, walked off. It was like a quick send off. Like, all right, you know, I did what I did, whatever. You can tell when somebody does it in a spiteful way when somebody didn't mean to do it, they'll kind of, like, even when Draymond Green slammed Brandon Clark, he was there for a minute, making sure he was okay, like, oh, you good, you know what I'm saying, and then walked off. You can see that from certain players. So I think the one game is cool. You know, I don't think, oh, suspended for the series. Nah, nah, it's a still playoff basketball. I understand GP's out for the playoffs, but, you know, don't suspend him for the whole playoffs. You know, he's not, he hasn't shown any consistent dirty plays Throughout his career, for the most part, Dylan Brooks is just an aggressive, you know, outgoing type of player. He's not a dirty player. So I wouldn't deem him that. You know, just the one game is cool. All right, he's suspended for one game. Now let's move on from the situation after game three. Do I think the Warriors are still going to win? It really depends. And, you know, I'm I'm a pretty advocate of the Warriors going to the finals. You know, I've been pretty strong. This series... I, like I don't I don't know how every, anybody else I'm not impressed with Memphis I'm, like I'm not at all impressed with Memphis you know you look at the two games Golden State has had the most turnovers in both games but Golden State has led t- both games in field goal percentage Golden State has shot 36 percent in the first game 18 percent from the three point line in the second game they weren't good and on top of that they led the rebounding in both games even with playing small ball lineups Wiggs playing the four Draymond playing the five it's so it's like They've been out rebounding this team. They've been efficient from the field on this team. They've just been turning the ball over, missing open shots. Like, I think those shots are going to continue to be there. They just have to take care of the ball. And if they hit those shots, then I don't see how they lose this series. You know, I think as great as John Moran has been, I feel like Golden State has still been playing a little bit better than them. Even Ja, he's been amazing. He's been incredible. You know, but I think the way they're defending him, they're kind of allowing him to do that in a sense. You know, letting him... Get that open three-point shot, which they're going to keep giving him. He's just going to keep hitting. If he keeps hitting, there's literally nothing you can do. You know, letting Andrew Wiggins switch off on him when they set a screen is not good because Jordan Poole cannot guard him and Clay cannot keep up with him. There's certain things on the defensive scheme that they have been doing good. But no, 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 I still think I got I still think I got Warriors in six. You know, I think Warriors going to be in go uh, not Golden State, pardon me, going to be at home. They're going to be able to pull it out. I still think Steph and Clay are due for a couple big games. Wiggs is going to be due for – he's been great defensively and on the glass, but offensively he has been able to hit shots. So I think he's due soon. So, yeah, I got worries in six. The Brooks play was just reckless. Like, th- there's not much else to say. And, yeah, he probably should have gotten suspended a game. Like, you just can't do that. And if weird. You, if you don't suspend the player, and then it's like, oh, it's okay. Like, no, like, you can't do that in the NBA. Yeah. And – there is the emotional complex where Gary Payne has done so much to work to this point, and now all of a sudden he's out to the finals, if the Warriors can even get there. Um, but then you said the Grizzlies don't impress you. John Moran is the best player in the series. I agree. And beyond that, this this series is going to seven games. You think so? Yeah, over Steph, whose gravity is unmatched? No, John's been playing better. But Steph creates so many open looks for his teammate because of the gravity that he has. John's still been even playing Even when better. he doesn't have the ball. Just still been playing better. I mean, yeah. look at what has been going on with Memphis. Jaron Jackson Jr. just will probably foul out another two or three more times in the series. Go to seven games. The adjustments, though, that Taylor Jenkins can make and the adjustments Steve Kerr can make is what's going to decide this series. John Morant, you shouldn't leave him open from three because he's very good when you leave him open. 
You shouldn't let him go left though, because that's where he's most comfortable. Make him go right. The other thing too is like his strong hand. Yeah, you exactly. Him, he's mean, better going left. He's better. Go- Same thing. Like uh, just because you're right-handed does not mean you're going to always be better or more comfortable going right. Some guys are more natural going left. No, I agree. Be more deceptive. Ja likes going to his left. You gotta like you can't leave him open from three. Just the bad idea. Don't do that. The interesting thing is, can Desmond Bain step up? You saw a great game from Jared Jackson Jr. Game one played out of his mind. That's probably not going to... like. He played really bad in game two, really good in game one. You would hope he gets somewhere in the medium, um, but Jaren's just an incredibly erratic player. So Peter, what has impressed you outside of John Morant, which we already know he's going to do this, what has impressed you about Desmond, Memphis? Desmond being in round one is terrific, and he has done very little in the series. You would like to think he can step up, with Ja averaging 40 a game. So back to what points. has impressed you outside of John Morant for Memphis? Again, Desmond Baines should play better. No, he's not. Series. So that doesn't impress you. He's played basically as bad as you can possibly expect in this series after playing terrific in game one. Yeah. Or round one, excuse me. Yeah. Um, and the interesting thing is, does Taylor Jenkins go to Steven Adams at the five? Because Jaron Jackson just cannot be the sole rim protector right now. He's best at the four with Steven Adams. Now against Golden State, Steven Adams, we saw off Jokic last round. Traditional centers don't do well against Gold State. It's usually a bad thing, and Steven Adams in space got absolutely cooked by Carl Anthony Towns, and we all want to see him off of our screens because he's a horrible matchup. And that same thing can be applied with Golden State, but if they're not shooting anywhere near as well as they did against Denver, then you maybe can get away with Steven Adams playing at the five with Jaron, and Jaron's not in foul trouble, and all of a sudden the Grizzlies' most important defensive player who's been mostly a non-factor when in foul trouble can play more in his element, and that is the X factor here. Golden State does not have their best perimeter stopper in Gary Payton to throw on John Morant. Right. That's a, a piece to the puzzle that they're not going to have the rest of the series. But with the Grizzlies, there is some other things they can go to. You get Dylan Brooks back after Game 3. He didn't play in Game 2, and they won without him. Those little things can make the world of a difference. But then also, will Steve Kerr have... Will he defend Ja differently? What will Steve Kerr do, do to switch that up? Because he's averaging... 49 and 9 against them, which is just berserk. And you like to think again, the dude can shoot open threes. Don't leave him open from three. That's just a bad idea. Um, but can they force him right, make him uncomfortable, send more pressures away? And also, with foul, um, not foul trouble, with turnovers, Golden State turns over the ball a lot, and the Grizzlies create a bunch of turnovers. That's probably not going to change. That's just the nature of these two teams. Turnovers are going to be a factor for Golden State. That's the one uh, downside with their offense. They turn over the ball a lot, and the Grizzlies capitalize off of that. That's why they're one of the best transition teams I've seen this year. Ja has been impressive. And to talk about the Dylan Brooks play first, I think it was unnecessary. Dylan Brooks should have got suspended. Whether he's a dirty player or not, I don't I don't I mean I don't think he is. It's just the first time it's really happened. Um it's unfortunate for Gary Payne because he did have a great journey and that's huge, you know, because he's the best defender on John Morant. Yeah. He can keep up with him the agility, he has a quickness too. Andrew Wiggins does it, and that's going to be a huge factor in this series going forward. I believe so. Dylan Brooks being out for Game 3, I think, does not matter. <laughs> I really don't. I just, think, offensively, he'd be bugging sometimes. I think Memphis, I've said it before, I think they're better without Dylan Brooks. Dylan Brooks, takes his shot diet is horrible. He takes bad shots. He's taking away shots from Desmond Bain because he, he he's going to, he's going to, Hoist up at least 15 to 18 shots a game. You can book that. Just randomly. I wouldn't be surprised if we see a big game from Desmond Bain, Desmond Bain in game three. I, I really believe that. And I think Zaire Williams played well within his role, composed. Because Zaire Williams knows he's a rookie. He can't do the BS stuff on offense yeah. that Brooks does. So what he's going to do is he's going to cut well. He's going to spot up. He's going to play good defense. Put he's not going to. Yeah, he's, he's just going to be an effort guy. And I think that's more important to Memphis than to Dylan Brooks. Even though Dylan Brooks is a very vocal leader for them, not dying what he does, but I think they don't really need him. Like, they really don't. I really don't think so. For Golden State, it's surprising to me that they've out-rebounded Memphis because it doesn't look like it. It feels like Memphis gets timely rebounds. And although Golden State is a small team, the fact that they're able to get these rebounds Wiggins, man. is is pretty crazy. Wiggins does keep a lot of things alive. Mm-hmm. I think this is a six-game series, though. They shot 18% from three and lost by five points, I believe. I five. Mean, you know, that's not going to happen again. You have Clay, who's one of the best shooters in the world. You have Steph, who's one of the best shooters in the world. 
Jordan Poole is a very good shooter. Shooting 18% from three is not going to happen again at all. You talk about Dylan Brooks' shot selection. Clay's has not been good in the series. And Jordan oh, Poole defensively has. has been. I mean, we didn't see against Denver because who's going to cook Jordan Poole defensively? I mean, on the Denver? only guy that's cooking Jordan Poole is Ja, right? Yeah, exactly. But, like, you look you look at Ja, and Ja's been, inc- like, he's been otherworldly. Also, at home, he averages, like, 28, but on the road, he declines. Who you talking about? Ja. Yeah, I think he's talking about Ja. On the road, okay. in the playoffs, at least, when he's been in Minnesota, he hasn't had good games. And and you talk about some, don't, Ja, his shots when he's open. Well, no, I don't think that's that. He was, these are the same shots Minnesota gave him. He's just making them now, which is... Credit to him, you know I can't be mad at that. But like you live with the shot, yeah. You, you live with you don't want him. You don't you don't if you, you press up on him once he blows by you that first step. That and we're not a rim protecting team defense. that can do that. And, and like you said, eighteen percent. The Warriors are not going to shoot eighteen percent from the three point line. Is Desmond yeah. Bain going to shoot twenty two percent from three? I don't know well, exactly. <laughs> I mean, but like this one is of the no, but ten best shooters in no, the game. No, 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 you're you're talking about something that's not historic. The Warriors are historically not going to shoot eighteen percent from the three point line ever again. Like you, you know that. Like that's Steph and Clay aren't going to do that again. So it's like they're due. It's one one. They they lost by five. You know, game two was incredible. Game one they won by one. Game one was also, like this has been an incredible. This has probably been the best series so far in round two. Like this has been back and forth. But I think like the Golden State hasn't even played their best yet, and I don't think it's because of Memphis. Defense in a sense, I think it's more because they're just missing a lot of open looks. You know, I think the turnovers you said, M- Memphis causes turnovers, but a lot of them sometimes, like there was in last game, fourth quarter, Steph would just made like two turnovers in a row, and they were just dumb passes, like passes he just doesn't make on a regular basis. Like I think a lot of these turn, like a lot of these mistakes are Golden State warranted, like mental mistakes in their minds. And I think going home, they're definitely going to bounce back. That's like you said, these. Steph turnovers that don't make sense. That's part of this matchup. The Grizzlies force a bunch. The Warriors commit a lot. So, like, no matter how you want to word it, I mean, no matter what, a lot of turnovers from Golden State should be expected. It's not like, whoa, they're turning the ball. That's what the Warriors do. They turn over the ball a good amount. And the Grizzlies, like I touched on before, just cost a bunch. Um, and then the other thing, too, is if they go to Steven Adams and the Warriors aren't shooting the way they're they did against Denver. They're going to exploit that badly. Well, the Warriors have been... I mean, I get why you say that because the Warriors have actually shot really efficient in the paint. So I get you saying, go to Steven Adams, Jaron Jackson plays better at the four. It's understandable. But then you're 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 in danger of putting Steven Adams out there and just praying. You're, you're basically saying, I'm going to pray that the, the Warriors don't shoot good for the series. Because if Steven Adams is out there, he's going to get picked on every play. Jaron Jackson Jr. is a lot more versatile than a Nikola Jokic. And in those scenarios, Jaron is more in his element if you can kind of, it's tough because Steven's not traditional. What's or he's a very we talk about he's versatile in terms of if they beat Steven Adams to the rim, right? Yeah, but they don't need to do that all the time. Which means you are banking on the fact that they're not going to shoot great at all because they can just create separation at the three point line. Poole can do it. Steph can do it. We'll talk about Clay another time. I don't know what's wrong with him. He's tripping. But Steph can do it, and Poole can do it at a pretty high rate. So it's like you're you're hoping you're basically banking on we're gonna give you those three-point shots because you're not hitting them, and we're going to get our rim protection back because that's where you've been effective at. When Jaron's not in foul trouble, if he can kind of have, like, Adams, when he's in there with him, a lot changes for Jaron. Yeah, I agree. And right now what they're going with, with no Adams, is not working. And if you just add a little bit of spice and at least try that, which credit to Taylor Jenkins for making that switch early in round one, but sometimes you got to mix and match, and you yeah. got to change stuff up. Well, and right now, yeah. he needs to. Well, Adams couldn't play game two health and COVID protocol, so I don't know if he'll be able to yeah. play game three. But I think Golden State wins these next two in Oracle. Not Oracle. Or the Chase, Chase Center. Yeah. <laughs> I think game five, Memphis gets it, and game six, Warriors close it out. Four, two, six game series. You still haven't answered my question. What are you impressed about Memphis outside of John Morant? It's the potential and, and moves. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think everybody's. everybody's Impressed by their potential. I'm talking about right now in the series. Two games. What have you been impressed with? Other than Ja, because everybody's, he's otherworldly. Game one, Jaron Jackson, obviously, but you know he's not going to do that again. So I ask you. I am projecting here. <laughs> I am projecting with Jaren. Brandon Clark hasn't impressed you? Brandon Clark, yeah, he has, but I mean, like they need a little more to it than just Brandon <laughs> Clark. Yeah. Like, this is not as good of a matchup for him as like Minnesota, he was cooking because of that high wall, the, the Timberwolves run, that's mm-hmm. perfect for him to cook. Uh, as a role man and a rebounder, his rebounding is awesome. The energy, yeah. 
Uh, that's just not quite enough in this matchup. And to me, if Jaron Jackson Jr. can just not foul out or, or at least stay out of foul trouble for two games, the whole dynamic for the, the Grizzly shifts. Well, I don't even blame Jaron Jackson because on both sides, the officiating was terrible in Memphis. So uh, Some of them fouls he shouldn't have even got. But what do you think is Desmond Bain's problem? Like, why is he in, isn't playing as good as he played before? I ultimately think it's the two-game sample. Like, he's been maybe a top five shooter the last year and a half. No, he's an elite shooter. And shooters are going to have... I think he said that he actually said today, outside of Steph, I'm the best shooter in the league. So He's in the conversation as top five, top three. Yeah. I think for him, he'll be fine. Like, he's so good of a shooter. Guys are going to have some off nights. He just hasn't... Sh- he's 22% from... And a fantastic shooter, it's going to change. I yeah. think for him, it's just a matter of making shots. I think Dylan Brooks, maybe that did play a role, but in, in game two without Dylan, he still didn't play well. Yeah. I think he'll be fine. He'll be better. Probably clo- like 23, 24 a game against Minnesota. Now he's at seven. I expect that to be at least 14, 15 the rest of the series, the next five games. But you, you don't think it was because um, Minnesota ran the high wall. So it allowed other players to cook up. You don't think it was just more of that in terms of now go to state is just going one on one, man to man. They're not giving you any type of wall, and that's like now he's he's looking at a different scheme and he's struggling with that. That definitely plays a role. He's Especially also for a great. shooter. He's great in transition too. If he can get going, continuing to get going more in transition, yeah, that can just get him into a little bit of a rhythm for a shooter. You get a little bit of confidence, then you're in a little bit more of a groove in the half court. I think for him, it's really just a matter of a small sample. Makes sense. So who you got? I got Warriors in seven. Oh, so you still got the Warriors. Okay. I think ultimately it comes down to what adjustments can be made because the Grizzlies are a totally different team when Jaron's out of foul trouble. And if they can find a way to just get him below four, like, and he can be himself, Mm -hmm. and he's more aggressive as that rim protector, Golden State's going to have a hard time getting to the rim with him. He's like a top 10 defender in the NBA. And in this series, he's been rendered useless in many cases, just like he was in round one. Yeah, They're a JJJ breakout away. That's what it is. He's just so undisciplined and stupid sometimes. It's ridiculous. Like, i I just <laughs> never seen a player to still be that in, like, year three. Like, it's crazy to me. He's dynamic yeah. as a foul. He's been having foul trouble since he was a rookie. It's crazy. It'd be the same type of fouls. He's sometimes too aggressive. Sometimes he... Jumps too early. It's the same type of foul since your rookie year. It can give you whatever type of foul you want, though. Yeah. yeah. Anything you need. On to the next series, Celtics and Bucks. Now, what do you guys think of this series, what's been happening so far? And Giannis hasn't been shooting well, and that's led to some people saying, you know, why did you guys slander KD and not Giannis? So I want to ask you that question as well. Do you think Giannis is as deserving of the backlash that Kevin Durant got for underperforming versus the Celtics? Oh, uh, what do you think? Well, no, because it's two games. So, <laughs> no, and he already won more game, more games than KD. And I think so all right, so let's 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 dig let's dig into this a little bit. Game 1, they threw the same type of defensive scheme in a sense, like not the same exact whereas KD, they had a guy man up, but when he went right or left, then they threw somebody at him. Giannis, they just double teamed him. But the difference with Giannis is he was able to pick them apart with his playmaking. He wasn't getting it going offensively. He understood that. But his playmaking, it was the separator between him and Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant couldn't figure it out until game four. Giannis figured it out game one, as in game two. What Udoka did was he started just keeping them in single coverage, and the Bucs weren't hitting shots. And they, they got down early. Jalen Brown had a Michael Jordan like first quarter. They got down early, and it was just catch up from the moment there. Kevin Durant, like, Kevin Durant, people, people like to say this year he had to carry the load, which I understand. He did. Harden wasn't at his best. Kyrie was in and out, part timer, all that. Kevin Durant had to keep this team afloat. It's probably way down on him, yes. But the difference between Kevin Durant and Giannis right now is Giannis is a willing playmaker, and he can see different reads that Kevin Durant cannot. We thought Kevin Durant was making the evolution in his playmaking. Giannis has done that. You can tell he can just see different things on the court as a playmaker that Kevin Durant can't. This is why Giannis is a better basketball player than him right now. Offensively, he hasn't gotten it going. Grant Williams is no slouch. He's been a great defender. On I think he's a honestly, in my opinion, I think he's a better defender on Giannis than Rob because he's a lot bigger up top. You know, Al Horford, he does his, you know, he's always, Giannis has always struggled with Al Horford, no matter his age. It's insane. And I think the the Boston Celtics have a defensive scheme that's great. And I think what's missing is that other guy. Middleton 
was missing in game two. Not game one, but game two. Like other guy that can go out and get a bucket. Drew Holiday, he was struggling a little bit too early. But I think this series is still going to be a dogfight. I think defensively, both these teams have been awesome. I think Drew Holiday, his ability to guard, I don't think Tatum got it going late in game two, but I think Drew Holiday calls him hell for, for the most part, and his possessions has been amazing. But Grayson Allen has been a cone. Wesley Matthews has been really huge on defense, though. Shout out to Wesley Matthews. He's been great. But I think going to Milwaukee, they're comfortable. They've been good. You know, they managed to steal one in Boston. If the Bucs can just hit their shots, they're going to be fine. Defensively, they've been fine. Offensively, they just have to hit. Giannis is going to need those guys, but Giannis needs to step up himself offensively, and he has to have a, a big game. They won't win this series unless Giannis has a big game because that's just the type of series it's going to be. Without Chris Middleton, he needs to be that guy. But I think, all in all, the Bucs have been great. I still have the Bucs in six. I think they'll still pull it out, and I think they'll – the shooters are going to definitely start to hit shots. Bobby Portis, Brooke Lopez, Pat Connaughton, Grayson Allen. They just need to figure out that defensive scheme Grayson Allen gets in. But I think all in all, this has been a great series. I still got the Bucks though. Do you think those shooters can still get going if the Bucks don't have, like early in possessions, the Celtics are doubling. They're straying away from that now. The pressure is on Giannis to score in the post. I th- yeah, I think the problem with sometimes Giannis does in a possession, he plays with it. I think a lot of the times he gets it. Now he wants to dribble, dribble. Or try to hezzy. And I th- a lot of times he played like you need to, it's 24 second shot clock. You get the ball at 14, go. There should be no reason why you're dribbling for five of that second shot clock. And now you're making like, like what Luca does. You're waiting, waiting. And now you have to pin it to somebody. Grayson Allen can make a play off the ball or he can make, a, he can create his shot off, on the ball. Bobby Portis has that ability to pump fake, hit the mid range, you know, come to the side. So it's like you, Drew Holiday with the same. You have players that can do that. So 14, 15, 16 seconds, get the ball. Make a play. Be aggressive. You know, stop diverting to the... At the end of the day, nobody on the Bucks can stop you. I mean, on, on Boston can stop you if you're just going. Just keep going. Keep attacking. And honestly, in Milwaukee, they play amazing at home. And when that crowd gets it going for them, they get hot. And they, I know firsthand, they start shooting at a ridiculous rate. Guys start to come alive. So I expect the Bucks to come out firing in Milwaukee, to be honest. It, all, it is kind of scary, too. Ime Udoka has done a great job the second half of this year just adjusting. And you saw in game two, the way that the Celtics switched things up defensively. So many people are saying the series is over after one game, and we're like, oh, the Celtics are overrated. They can't match up with Giannis and the Bucks. Nope, not true at all. Nope. And that's the scary thing. Can, like, so much of playoff basketball is coaching, and this is why so many people were down the Bucks last year. Do we trust Mike Boonholzer against Ime Udoka with what he's shown throughout this year? That's what we're going to find out. I like Ime Udoka a lot. And with what we've seen, he has the edge over Boonholzer. And just year one, that not only speaks to how good of a coach Udoka is and can can be, but also the way the series can go late. It's going to be a dogfight. A lot of it's going to come down to the finer details that are being moved around. And a lot of the time that goes toward the better coach making the better adjustments. Yep. I think you guys said a lot of good things. Um, in terms of the Giannis and KD thing, Giannis is averaging a triple-double in this series. You can see that the playmaking is on a different level to the point that in game one, he won that game because of his playmaking, because of his ability to adjust to what Boston's defense was doing. I think also game one, you you seen how you seen Boston at their best and at their worst in game one and game two. Game one, they generated a lot of threes that weren't efficient from three. Game two, they still generate a lot of threes, but they shot the lights out, and that's ultimately why the the Bucs had no chance because Jalen Brown in first quarter had, what, 12 to 15 points, somewhere around there. Everybody was hitting their shots. In two games, they have already taken 93 93 threes against the Bucs. The Bucs are a team that they allow a lot of threes. They allow some of the more open threes in the NBA. They are not a great team at defending that. If the Celtics can hit at a clip, at a reasonable clip, 35 to 40%, I do think there's no reason why they don't win this series. I think the Bucs have to adjust in that way. That has to be Budenholzer's adjustment, limiting threes. The Celtics aren't a great team in terms of generating offense at an efficient rate if they're always driving to the basket. The Bucs rely too heavily on trying to just protect the paint when in this series it should be more focused on guarding the perimeter and making sure we're not giving up these open looks to 
a bunch of players who shoot forty yeah. percent from three. Rob Williams is not going to destroy you down low in the paint. He's just not. You have a lot of guys. You're guard, you're playing a perimeter oriented team in a sense. Maybe not perimeter, but a little bit up out the paint. Jalen Brown, J- Jason Tatum, Marcus Smart when he comes back, even Peyton Pritchard, Derek White. These are guys who like to play on the perimeter, like to play alongside the elbow. You don't need to protect the paint because there is no dominant paint presence on the Celtics. Defensively, yes, but offensively, no. So this has been Buda Holzer. This is why he almost got fired if it wasn't for that championship, honestly. His his attention to detail and his adjustments aren't Popovich-like, even though he's come from that tree. And it sucks, but you have to adjust, and this is where he's probably going to get tested the most. Yeah, I mean, there was no reason for the Celtics to shoot 30-plus threes, what, in game one, then shoot 40-plus in game two. Like, that in itself shows lack of adjustments and adjusting to the personnel and how Boston likes to play. You know, you limit those threes, it's a different series. And, I mean, Boston shot 43 threes last game, I think. Jeez. 43 is ridiculous. It's a ridiculous rate. So, if they if they keep allowing those many threes to be shot, I just don't see how Milwaukee wins this series. Does Boston have that level of shot making, though? To hit those threes? To beat you that way throughout an entire series. Like Derek White yeah. not making shots. Marcus Smart, we saw more of the, the shooting guard of Marcus Smart in game one. You have Tatum. He's shooting 44% from three in the series. That's now what he shot in the regular season, 35%. Jalen Brown, he's he shot incredibly well in game two. Can he keep that up? Because he's one of the most up and down sporadic stars in the game. Al Horford shooting like over 50% from three in the series. In the regular season, he shot a little bit under 30% at one point. Grant Williams and Peyton Pritchard were the only high-level shooters. And with Peyton Pritchard, he's got so many other issues because of his size defensively that I don't know necessarily if that shooting from the outside is going to kill Milwaukee because yeah. Brooke Lopez has been terrific at the rim. He's 33, 34 years old, coming off back surgery, and looks better than ever. That's insane. And ultimately, I don't think it's as big of a deal that the Celtics are taking a bunch of shots if they aren't making them. When Marcus Smart comes back especially. If in game two they shot forty six percent from three, I don't think they do that again. Yeah, I think, but they can definitely shoot 36 percent yeah. as a team. But that's what they shot in game one, and it was a close game. No, it's a blowout. And nah, I know. <laughs> so, I mean, listen, I think that Boston will still win this series if they're able to generate those type of shots. Yeah, I think that they guarded it better in game one. In game two, there was more open looks. Well, game two, it really was just Jalen Brown got hot and they just, they got fumbled. They got punched in the mouth early. And the Bucks didn't take any threes. They're a team that loves to take threes. They took 19 and they made three. The, That's the, totally Boston's defense adjusted perfectly in game two. The other the other moving piece is, can the Bucks get that three-point shooting? Because like you touched on Grayson Allen, he can create an isolation a little bit. And that's really like, maybe their go-to pick-and-roll ball handler at times. It also, it also depends because, you know, Game one, they doubled Giannis. Giannis play make very well, and the team got hot. They shot well. Game two, the doubles weren't as there. Nope. They were guarding up on their players, and that's why they didn't generate those threes. So they're probably thinking now, like, okay, you know what? We're just going to play Giannis straight up. We're not going to double him. Yes, the cook. And he has to be the one to beat us. And with the defenders they have at the, on the back line able to rotate on Giannis, that's a much tougher matchup for him. And it, Middleton's absence is going to be felt in this series because he's somebody that can create off the dribble and create his own shot, and, and they don't and have that. Their pick and roll was great. Them running the two-man. He has to figure it out. Giannis is a great player, though. He should be able to figure it out. He, one-on-one with Grant Williams, I expect Giannis to come out on top. Is this his biggest challenge yet? Because he doesn't have Chris Toronto. with him. Okay. This is definitely up there. I will put Toronto, though. Because Who do you they, have in this series? I have Celtics in seven. This is going to seven, I feel like, just like just like the Memphis series. Everything for you is seven, man. Because this is who did I, I, really told, I told somebody shot. first round, no seven, no game sevens, no game sevens. I think I was right. I think I was right. You think? No game sevens. In first round, I thought no game sevens. You think this is going to end before seven games? No game sevens. I'm pushing it, bro. Uh, no game sevens. No game sevens. I could see Memphis and Golden State going to six or five, but I this think is this is a seven game series. This is seven. I can see Golden State and Memphis going to seven before this one. Really? Yeah. The way both was, yeah, I could definitely. So see you that. have Celtics in six? No, I don't. I ain't swiping out. I'll, I'll Bucks in six, man. No. <laughs> I think you know Bucks gonna pull out the win. Yeah, hmm? Giannis is what makes you think that. Um, this one, yes, in a sense, 
I still like I thought defensively they played better without Middleton, but I think offensively, I I, I really honestly didn't think Grant Williams could guard Giannis the way he can guard him. That's why that's what really kind of like threw me off. So now I'm kind of at a weird spot. Like all right. Now they they could guard him one on one, but then it's like he's going home. So let me wait and see. But I think they'll split regardless. Giannis Milwaukee. was miss, missing some finishes that he should have been making. Yeah, it, was, it kind of was one. throwing me off because game one, I'm like, you know, I walked in, I'm thinking, okay, I know Giannis is a better playmaker, right? So I know like he'll be, he'll make the right pass, right? So game one that happens, I'm like, all right, cool. Game two, I told Rico actually, I was talking to Rico on Discord. I'm telling him like, yo, game two, you guys are not going to send double teams. You're literally not going to do it. They go in, they don't send double teams. Giannis is struggling. So I'm like, oh, shit. Like, what, what am I going to do now? So now I'm, like, in a situation where it's, like, game. They're at home. You know how Milwaukee gets. You know how Milwaukee gets. It gets loud. They play amazing. They play, like, crazy at home. But it's, like, Middleton is usually the guy that cooks up at home. He turns into Michael Jordan in Milwaukee. So now I'm kind of, like, stuck in this weird spot. But I, I stand on what I say. So Milwaukee in six. <laughs> you want to change your prediction now? Who? You. Nope, can't tell you. <laughs> that means you do want to change it. Nah, I'm gonna stick. I'm gonna stick. I'm gonna stick to Milwaukee because they still have a good chance. It's been a great series. So I'm gonna stick to Milwaukee. That's gonna do it for episode 177 of the Pick Aside Podcast. You can follow us on Twitter at Pick Aside Pod, on Instagram and TikTok at Pick Aside Podcast, and buy merchandise at PickAsidePodcast.com. Thank you for listening and/or watching, and we'll see you next time.